to the pyramids. No, that's the way to the Inca Temple, darling. Uh, are, are we lost? Oh, no. <laughs> this world touring would be a lot easier with a map. What, Ooh, was, what was that? that? Ah! Rapu, at your service. Oh my, a tiger. Bengal tiger, to be precise, madam. You fellows seem to be, shall we say, lost. And it just so happens that I have a world. Perhaps you will allow me the honor of guiding you to my favorite place to uncover the magic and mystery of our wondrous planet, the firework dragons of China. The tiniest rainforest creatures in. The mighty sumo wrestlers of Japan! Oh, oh, that stuff sounds really, really fun! Oh, it sure does, huh? Here is my beautiful world map. Wow! Just pick a country to visit, and <laughs> away we go! Toothbrush? Check. Passport? Check. Okay. Take us away! <laughs> Russia, ready or not, here we come! Russia! <laughs> Look out! The Gigglebone Gang's arrived! <laughs> hey, you wanna bring some toys to life? Then pick me! It will be an honor and a privilege. Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then, when it's all ready, we'll begin. Hmm? Not so very long ago, in Russia, there lived a hideous witch with a bad cough and a serious sleep disorder. Her name was Baba Yaga. <laughs> That's me, and I'm back. You just try <laughs> She also had a cat named Sergei, who never spoke to anyone, which seemed to be why the witch tolerated him. One cold day, a young servant girl made her way up the path to the cottage. Her name was Olga. Lost and hungry, she stopped to pet the cat who sat beside the sleeping witch. Oh, you're such a sweet kitty, whispered the girl, reaching to scratch him in just that place that spurs a cat's lifelong devotion. <laughs> I'm yours, thought the cat, though he didn't dare say it aloud. Suddenly, the witch's evil crow swooped down from his perch and pecked Baba Yaga on the head. Ouch! What? <laughs> my, my! Who have we here? <coughs> Please, ma'am, I was wondering if you have anything to eat? Eat, you say? <laughs> Not to worry, right, puss? Old Baba will fix you something. <laughs> Baba Yaga tore off a hunk of bread and handed it to the girl. Here, my little pet, eat up! <laughs> Sergei tried to open his mouth. He wanted to yell, No, don't eat that bread! But alas, his lips stayed sealed, as Olga eagerly pushed the bread into her mouth and ate it all up. In an instant, she turned into a small sparrow and was locked in a birdcage by the witch. Why did you do that? erupted the cat. As if the words came from a volcano, the witch was dumbfounded indeed. Why? Wh what else would I do with a little girl? Let her go! Unfortunately, there was only one way the witch's spell could be broken. Only the key of St. George opens that door, and I haven't got it. It was stolen last year by the Emperor of China. Take my magic eyeball if you want. He'll help you find your way. <coughs> way. <coughs> but just as Baba Yaga went to fetch the eyeball, she was stricken by sleep. <coughs> and no amount of shaking would wake her. Maybe you can help Sergei find Baba Yaga's magic eyeball. I know he would be grateful. Cat! Cat! 
Get cat! Roo! Cat! Roo! Roo! Oh, please help me! Get me out of here, please! Please! What's all the fuss? Hey, you're lucky it didn't end up in here. Nope! Nope! Never saw that ball! Nope! Nope! Not one eye at all! Ow! Hey, watch that landing! The eyeball had seen the entire episode and was eager to help Sergei get to China. Hot too, bub. Time's a-wasting! Okay, which way? Maybe you can help Sergei find Baba Yaga's magic eyeball. I know he would be grateful. I wouldn't trust that eyeball as far as I could throw it. Sweet bee, sweet bee, the magic eyeball. Hmm, I haven't swept it up. Sweet bee, sweet bee. No! No! Never saw that ball! No! No! Not one eye at all! Ow! Hey, watch that landing! The eyeball had seen the entire episode and was eager to help Sergei get to China. Hot too, bub. Time's a-wasting! Okay, which way? Uh, that way. Sergei had a funny feeling this was not quite right, but the eyeball persisted, and eyeballs can be very persistent. Hey, you calling my vision into question? I've seen South, bub, and this is South! We'll be in China before you can say chop liver! But the further they walked, the colder it got. And just as the cat began to doubt the eyeball's intentions, it screamed out, Stop! We're here! Here? Where? Mountain Troll! Mountain Troll! Hey, I'm back! Out of a cave on the mountainside crawled a blind, filthy troll with a bloody hole where one of his eyes belonged. As Sergei put two and two together, the eyeball leaped into the empty socket. Oh, ho, ho, I can see again. <laughs> I can see. The troll danced a celebratory jig as Sergei exploded. This is not China! No, no, it's Norway. Sorry, bub. <laughs> My eyeball lied. <laughs> they have a tendency to do that. <laughs> Taking pity on the feline, the mountain troll offered to send Sergei to China using his magic powers if the cat would help him with one small thing. I lost my pot of gold, and I need it back, but me and my eyeball gotta get reacquainted. So, how about you find my gold, and I'll send you anywhere you wanna go? Sergei is still so angry, he can barely see. Do you think you could help him find the pot of gold for the mountain troll? Checking. Checking. Nope. Not a single ounce. Not anywhere. I can't tell you for sure mm, where it is. Hmm. We hide a lot of gold, but it's not here now. <laughs> Thought I was a pot of gold, did you? Well, you better look again. I don't have it, and if I did, I wouldn't give it to you. Hmm. I get so tired sitting all day. <laughs> My friend is the pot of gold. <laughs> oh, goo goo ga 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 gold. Ga ga ga. <laughs> Sergey was picking up the scattered gold pieces when the sky grew dark and a remarkably deformed foot appeared next to the pot. Just what do you think you're doing with my gold? Nobody steals from me, said the mountain troll. But before Sergei could say a thing, the mountain troll picked him up by the tail and swung him round and round. This is what happens to a flea-bitten gold snatcher like you, said the mountain troll. 
letting go of the cat's tail, Sergei was thrown so high in the sky. Bye-bye! He entered the stratosphere and spent 30 long seconds breathless, watching the world turn rapidly beneath him. Eventually, he did fall. Of course, Sergei, being a cat, landed unhurt on all four feet on the soft earth of China, half a world away. Sauntering up to the unicorn, Sergei asked for help. Hello? 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 But the horned horse acted as if he'd heard nothing. So Sergei tried the other animals and encountered the same degree of deafness. What is going on here? Unbeknownst to our friend, the emperor's garden maintained a stringent animal hierarchy. Those higher up on the list, such as unicorns, refused to listen to those below, and cats were listed at the bottom of the barrel, lumped together with the mosquitoes. Finding the key of St. George would be nearly impossible. If no one is willing to listen, perhaps they might talk to you. Sergei needs your help. But whatever you do, don't let him go near the unicorn's prized carp pond. Brother, do you see that cat actually try to talk to me? Wasn't that the, the sickest thing you ever saw? Oh, hello. I suppose I can talk to you. I believe I did see the Emperor with a key. Perhaps if you could shed a little more light on the subject. I have no interest in keys! Please go! Keys, 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 you may look as you please, please, please. There is a key in this garden that's called the key of St. George and many a cat has lost its way before those open doors. What about this key? Will it do? Sergei pawed around inside the lantern until he felt something cold and metallic and pulled out an ornate gold key. The unicorn cleared her throat pointedly. <coughs> Would somebody please inform this cat that he is in grave danger? All of China is beset by famine, and once he leaves these gates, he will not be safe. Heeding her warning, Sergei tucked the key under his arm and slunk homeward through a thousand-mile maze of back alleys and shadowy places until at last he reached Baba Yaga's cottage. On Tippy Paw, he slipped by the sleeping witch and silently unlocked the birdcage. Ah! Ah! warned the crow, waking the witch once more. But it was too late. Olga and the other sparrows flew from the cage and were immediately transformed back into young girls. Oh, you're a darling! sang the grateful girl as she kissed Sergei between his ears. Then she turned on the witch with a newfound venom. As for you, you decrepit bag of bones! The girls flew at the witch, each grabbing some part of her slovenly body, and shoved her into the birdcage. Locking the door, Olga handed the key to the crow and said, Take this to the deepest part of the ocean and dump it! Which the crow did forthwith. Now... The girls turned to Sergei and all but smothered him with attention. Does he like minced tuna? I want to serve him next! Olga and the others, aware that life at the cottage was much nicer than their poverty-stricken village, decided to stay forever. 
and as the fortunate feline reveled in his new found comforts, he once again became a rather closed mouth sort of mouser, breaking his silence only occasionally for a long, loud purr. That cat. <laughs> Where now, my friend? Oh, nice pickin'. Nice pickin' indeed. Mix and match is just coming up, champ. Hold tight. <laughs> hey, Skipper. Today's the big mix and match Russian egg hunt. Just press go and we're ready to start. Go! Okay, egg spotters, I've <laughs> laid an egg for you in the box and you drag it to where it's hidden in the picture. Here's another. Here's another. Here's another. Nicely done. How about this one? Eggs gal. What a scrap. What a scramble! Do these come? Wowzers! You did it! Well done! Hungry for more eggs? Let's play again! This'll be hard as a hard-boiled egg. These eggs are harder to find. Good luck, champ! Go! Eggs galore! Here's a... How about this one? Real. We're mixing it up now. Eggs galore. How about this one? One left. Wow, you're good. One more egg for the search. Well done, champ! Well done! An extra game? Okay, champ! Here we go again! Thanks a bunch, champ! See you soon! Eggs! Is it? What a scramble! What now, though? Okay! Let's go! Hey! <laughs> wait a sec! We'll be playing in no time! <laughs> oh, hey, we're in Russia, and we get to make a music box with ballet dancers from a show called The Nutcracker. <laughs> Click on my belly for the dancers, and everything you need to make a super duper music box. Hey! Oh, oh, evil mouse king. Oh, evil. <laughs> Let's put him on the music box. Cool. <laughs> now bring a key to the keyhole in the music box to make the dancer dance. Oh, oh, oh. Put this key in the keyhole. Dancer needs a friend to dance with. Hey, flowers! <laughs> oh, come on, give someone flowers. Yeah, oh, they're pretty. Uh, these are decorations for um, decorating stuff. <laughs> Go on, yeah. Oh, here's a prima ballerina. <laughs> that means she's the star. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> Wanna turn the key for a dancing tune?
want to snow on the music box? Go ahead, <laughs> make a blizzard! <laughs> Hey, do you think the Spanish dancer needs a snow dress? Jewels! Oh, wanna put some jewels on the music box? Oh, yeah. How about making the mouse wear flowers? <laughs> oh, brave nutcracker. Yeah. Oh, two people want to dance. <laughs> How about that? Hmm. Hey! Oh, two people want to dance. <laughs> How about that? Hmm. A Harlequin doll. <laughs> oh, he's a kind of clown, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Want to turn the key for a dancing tune? Yep. Oh, boy. <laughs> Want to turn the key for a dancing tune? Yep. How about making the mouse wear flowers? <laughs> Hey, this dancing toy, uh, <laughs> comes to life. How about making the mouse wear flowers? Oh, two people want to dance. <laughs> oh, a dancing Spanish doll. Oh, she's so pretty. How about making the mouse wear flowers? <laughs> Clara. Oh, I bet you she's dreaming about the nutcracker. Now, if you feed me, we can keep going. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> well, let's go find the others, okay? Okay, we'll be back soon. Yep. That nutcracker has to be the best ballet. How can we beat that? Well, I'll be a chicken fried pig. You chose me. <coughs> Darling, you just sit tight while I get my things together for this. I hope you packed for all kinds of weather, Dumplin', because Russia's home to some of the chilliest facts in the whole wide world. So bundle up warm and get ready to play Velma's Fact or Fib. 
Now you got to start somewhere with a country this big, right? So pick one of these six pictures and we'll be off. But don't forget, a few of these facts are really fibs in facts clothing, so keep an eye out. Now, the Russians have had a space program for many years and were actually the first people to send a rocket into outer space with the passenger. But did you know that passenger was a dog? How are you going to call it, doll? Is that a fact or a fib? Well, how about that? You are absolutely right. A dog was the first creature in space. Her name was Laika and she was launched into space on November 3rd, 1957. Now, Laika was specially trained for her mission, and Russian scientists padded the spacecraft to make it nice and comfy. And not only that, a special machine automatically fed her meals several times a day. Click on This Frozen Paradise is known as Murmansk, and it's way, way, way the heck up north. Fact. Things stay frozen in Murmansk pretty much all year. But believe it or not, there is a group of people up there who celebrate New Year's Day by going for a swim in the Barren Sea. Now, what's your verdict? Does that sound like a fact or a fib? <laughs> My goodness, you got that just right. This group really does swim in the Barren Sea at New Year's. Fact, it's so cold, these guys have to chip away the ice before they can get in. Calling themselves the Murmansk Winter Swimmers, they claim exercising in the winter air unlocks the secrets of good health. <laughs> well, good luck. Come on now, pick a fact, pumpkin. Did you know that Russia is the largest country in the world? It is so big that it covers 11 time zones. Now that means when it's 9 o'clock in the morning in Moscow in the west, why it is 7 o'clock at night, 6,000 miles away in Kamchatka on the east coast. Now how about that, darling? Am I a fact? Oh my, you know your Russian geography. Yes, indeed, it is true. Russia is a vast country. From metropolitan Moscow to camel herders far off in Karmakum, it's over 6,000 miles wide. Russia is so very huge, in fact, that its surface could cover over one half of the moon. Click on any picture and off we go. Nicholas II, Tsar of Russia, loved eggs so much, he hired one of the most famous egg chefs in all of Russia. Mr. Carl Fabergé. He specialized in poodleized pamplemouse eggs, Salvadorian sideways sandwiched eggs, and the Tsar's all-time favorite, crunchy curly curried eggs. Okay, hun, am I factin' or fibbin'? Oh, you caught me this time. Fabergé eggs are the beautiful jewel-encrusted creations of Carl Fabergé, and they're for gazing at, not for eating. Oh, no. The decorative eggs always had a secret surprise to them. This one had a teeny tiny mechanical bird that could pop out of the top, flap its wings, and tweet a little song. Now Moscow, being the capital of Russia and a major center for cultural activity, has a lot of schools that teach young Russians many things, including a school for clowns. Now what do you think, darling? Is old Velma telling a fib or is that an actual fact? Oh. oh, I'm sorry, honey. This time I wasn't fooling. Fact is, learning how to clown around is serious business. Oh, yes. Children spend years taking classes in acrobatics and juggling and gymnastics and balancing. Why, it takes most students years of practice balancing on a wire just two feet off the ground before they're allowed to get up on that high wire. Hey, did you know that many of Russia's older buildings are topped with giant onion domes? And that they're really made out of enormous onions that have been carefully preserved? So what do you think, honey? Is that a fact or a fib? <laughs> oh, you got me. Nice work. Even though they're sometimes called onion domes and they have a similar shape, they're not actually made of onions. Now, the most famous of these buildings is St. Basil's Cathedral. Oh, my goodness, look at those domes. Oh, my. Fact is, it's so big, it actually contains nine separate churches. Pick. Oh, my. Those fibs can wrap you up like a big old Russian bear hug. But how's about us tracking down Rapu and the others? Okay? Velma excels herself once more, don't you think? But whatever shall we do now? You'll like this stuff, I promise. 
Hang on, please. We're just getting ready. Hmm. Hold tight. We're gonna meet a real live falcon. Sasha is a soldier. He works at the Kremlin. He guards all the cannons. And he helps the tourists. Sasha has a falcon. A pretty bird named Tuchka. She lives there in Red Square. Every day she goes out and then Tuchka flies. Flies so high through the city every day. Past the market to the park. Flying where the children play. When she soars down the street. Past the church's golden domes. There's a Kremlin. There is Sasha. That's how Tuchka. What an incredible already? bird! How shall we follow that? Can you choose? Away to Peru! <coughs> Peru, Peru, Peru. Mountains, temples, and some spectacular llamas. Let's get the noggin joggin. Fancy some fib finding? Alright, let's check them out! <coughs> Hang on, please. We're just getting ready. Hey, come on, I'll show you some great pictures of Peru. I met a llama when I was traveling in Peru. He helps the family with everything they do. The children wear sweaters made from his wool. They keep nice and warm at play and in school. The ladies with blankets in color so pretty. They make fancy cloth to sell in the city. The llama helps people with everything they do. Up in the mountains of Peru. Okay, let's see Monty what else Sue is going is on. is really quite the photographer. What shall we do next? Well, I'll be a chicken fried pig. You chose me. Darling, you just sit tight while I get my things together for this. Watch out, darling. We're about to enter the mist-filled mountains of Peru. So throw on that fib protector and let's play... Velma's Fact or Fib. Now, the ancient Incan people lived in Peru for thousands of years and built a vast empire. But did you know they had no system of writing? No, sir. So, Incan accountants, like these fellas, kept track of all the people and all their stuff by tying little knots on a string. Now, does that sound like a fact or a fib? Oh, oh I know it sounds like a fib, honey, but it's true. The Incans did use knots tied on strings to keep track of things. It was a system called Quipu, and it consisted of up to 48 pieces of string attached to a long rope. And believe it or not, it was extremely accurate. Yeah! In fact, using this system, Incan rulers knew exactly what kind of taxes to collect even down to the last penny. Hey, here we're looking at Lake Titicaca. Located up in the Andes Mountains, it's the highest lake in the whole world. Did you know that some Indians actually live on islands they made out of nothing but reeds? Now what's your verdict, Cupcake? Is that a fact or a big ol' fib? <laughs> You're darn tootin' it's a fact. Nice work. The Indians really do build islands to live on using reeds that grow along the lake. They pile them up on the lake floor, making small but stable islands. And not only that, they also build houses out of the very same reeds. Why, they even weave the reeds together to make their fishing boats. There ain't nothing a reed can't do up there. Pick a fact and we'll get going. You may have heard that the astronauts bring freeze-dried food up. That is food that's been shriveled up and preserved by exposing it to freezing temperatures with them to eat on their trips to outer space. But did you know that the Peruvian Indians discovered the same method for preserving food hundreds of years ago? Now what do you think? Is that a fact or a fib? <laughs> yes, indeedy! The Indians have been freeze-drying food for centuries. You see, up in the mountains, the days are warm, but the nights are freezing cold. So the Indians leave food that they want to preserve out all night, and it freezes.
Then the next day, when things heat up, they press out the water and leave it out overnight again. They do this for several days and voila, it is freeze-dried. Come on now, pick a fact. Did you know that ancient Peruvians, known as Nazcas, made huge designs of birds and monkeys and flowers in the ground like this one so their alien friends from outer space would know where to land their big old spaceships? Hmm. Now pick your poison, doll. Am I affecting or fibbing? Hey, you got that one right. Yes, indeed. These designs were not alien landing strips, but their real purpose is... Well, it's still a mystery. I don't know. You see, the best way to look at the designs is from above in an airplane. And we know the ancient Peruvians didn't have those. Now, some people think that they were a kind of ancient calendar. Or a way to predict the movement of the stars. <laughs> oh, now mystery's kind of romantic, ain't it? Click on any one, and we'll get Peru is home to the Andes Mountains, the second highest mountain range in the world. And mountains this high are prone to a very serious illness called mountain sickness. Oh, look at this poor fella. Oh, my. Now, what do you think, darling? Is that a fact or a fib? <laughs> oh, correct, sweetie. That is a big old fib, a mountain-sized fib. Yes, indeed. Mountains don't get mountain sickness, but sometimes people do. You see, when people from the lowlands climb up high in the Andes, it gets real difficult to breathe because there's not a lot of oxygen high up in the mountains. And without enough air to breathe, people can feel sick or dizzy or real sleepy. And if you stay up there for two months or so, your body will eventually adjust and the sickness will just go away. Click. Oh, now ain't she a honey? Oh, I think so. She's what's known as an alpaca, and Peruvians have been using her wool to make clothing for thousands of years. While back in the Inca days, alpaca wool was considered so special, only royalty was allowed to wear it. Sound like a big fat fib? Or an actual fact? <laughs> oh, yes, sir. You sure got the facts straight. Nice work. The Incans did reserve alpaca wool just for royalty. Fact, anyone caught wearing it who was not royalty was punished severely. And even today, alpaca wool is highly prized and very expensive. Oh my goodness, oh sweet darling, those facts and these mountains have left me quite dizzy. So let's drop on down and find the gang, before I faint. You are a mine of information, Velma, but where should we dig now? You chose Rapu. Good choice. Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then, when it's all ready, we'll begin. There once was an Incan messenger girl named Malu, who was swift as the wind. But though she ran fast, Malu had trouble remembering the facts and figures she was entrusted with. Your Highness, the llama count was, um, well, you, you 340, one? No, two, uh, brown llamas, I think. Or, oh, wait, was it 423? No, no. Silence! roared the Emperor with great impatience, for this was not the first confused report he'd had from the girl. You are strong of foot, but weak of mind. Therefore, I banish you from this court until you learn to keep track of the royal ledgers. Poor Malu, for she so longed to be the emperor's most trusted messenger. And now I'm banished. Oh, Mama Yama, what shall I do? The kind mother Lama nuzzled Malu gently around the ears and was about to make a suggestion when Nisa, a rival messenger approached. There you are. I heard what the emperor said. Oh, Malu, how awful. But I know someone that can help you. With a grin that smacked of insincerity, Nisa told her of a witch in Russia who could improve her memory in exchange for a few large potatoes. She just takes out the old brain and puts a new one in. Falling for Nisa's outlandish quick fix, Malu packed a traveling basket. Malu, maybe there's an easier way. Where are those potatoes? I know I had some here somewhere. I have a thought. 
Please, Mamayama, I must be going. Now where am I going to find those potatoes? Perhaps here. Malu can find what she needs. Can you help her? Well, gosh, golly gee, it's so sunny up here. Malu snatched the potatoes up quickly. Hey, what's going on? We were just stretching. Malu politely explained her predicament to the potatoes, and they, of course, agreed to help. Well, okay, it's not like we have other plans. Malu tossed the potatoes in her basket and raced off, following the coastline of North America all the way to Alaska, and racing barefoot across the frozen Bering Sea. But alas, when Malu reached the crippled cottage of the witch, she had already forgotten who she was seeking. What was his name? Aga something? Uh, maybe it was a her. No, wait. Malu was still struggling with her memory when a cackling voice filled the pockets of the wooded den. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? Well, whoever you are, I'm looking for... Oh, who am I looking for? Can you help Malu find who she's looking for? Can you remember? Please come inside, my friendly abode. Baba Yaga, that's who she wants, Baba Yaga. Shwip, swap, swip. She runs like wind, so straight and tall. Too bad she remembers nothing at all. <laughs> It's a hint! Who makes a cackling laugh? Ah! A witch! Ah! Bingo! Ten points for the messenger! Called the crow, landing crassly on her shoulder. But it's lucky! You don't know her name, or else you'd have used it, and that would have been... All she wrote! Before Crow could finish his lecture, Baba Yaga appeared, dragging a huntsman behind her. <laughs> crow! Ah! Quick! Hide! If she sees you, you're dog meat! Malu and the crow hid in the shadows as Baba Yaga threw the huntsman into a boiling cauldron. No! No! <laughs> she was supposed to fix my memory. Ah, boy! Did somebody steer you wrong? But listen! Ah, I got a line on a drummer in Ghana with an amazing memory! Ah! Now run! Before she finds you here! Malu charged past the witch, who was busy adding salt to the kettle. <laughs> oh, who was that? And raced deep into the forest. On she ran for seven days and seven nights, all the while chanting, Find the drummer! Find the drummer! Find the drummer! Find the drummer! To keep her objective fresh in her mind. Exhausted, Malu finally arrived in Ghana and had just sat down at the edge of a fertile vegetable garden when she realized, much to her dismay, that her brain felt as open and empty as the sea. Suddenly, a sound pulsed softly around her. But only for a moment. Oh, please don't stop. It's beautiful. She began to search the garden for the sound she'd heard. Can you help her find the drummer hiding here? Be very careful not to disturb the napping Anansi. He has a wicked temper. Who are you? I'm Malu, said Malu, relieved to meet somebody her own age. She told the boy of her adventures and how the emperor banished her and bid her not to return until she could remember her facts and figures. You must be homesick, he said, and it was true for tears fell freely from Malu's eyes as she thought of her dear friend Mama Yama grazing in the Peruvian meadow. Don't cry, I can help you. The boy drew up his drums and began to tap out a rhythm. This is how we remember things in Ghana. We turn our stories and ceremonies into special rhythms and learn to play them. 
Here, you can take my drums home if you want. Malu took the drums gratefully, and together they walked down to the shore and found an old canoe. For Malu was very tired, and with the heavy drums she would not be able to run all the way back home. It is far to Peru. You must take two paddles. Thank you, said Malu, as the boy pushed her boat out to sea and waved to her silently. It was a serene passage across the Atlantic, and the young messenger landed uneventfully on the shores of Brazil. But she found herself struggling through the Amazon rainforest. Swinging from their tails, a rambunctious group of spider monkeys swooped down upon Malu and carried her drums away. Hey! Bring those back! <laughs> Pigs! The monkeys disappeared into the forest with the drums, and Malu returned home in exactly the same state she had left. A little older, a little wiser maybe, but no less forgetful. She flung herself down beside Mama Yama. Oh, Mama Yama, I've been all the way around the world, and no one can help me. The Emperor will never welcome me back. Malu, as I tried to tell you before, I have an idea. The Lama pulled three strands of hair from her own coat and gave them to Malu. Here, take the black strand and tie a knot on it for every black Lama you see. Do the same for the white and the brown strands. Then, when you reach the Emperor's palace, you will know your counts perfectly. Malu stared in amazement at the strands and Mama Yama's simple yet elegant solution. And do you know what? The system worked. From that day on, Malu was not only the Emperor's fastest messenger, she was also his most infallible. Her strands of llama hair became known as kipus and were used throughout the Incan Empire, for Mama Yama's idea was very easy to run with indeed. <laughs> Thank you for sharing a moment or two with the llamas and <laughs> yours truly. Shall we move on? Okay, let's go. Hey, <laughs> wait a sec. We'll be playing in no time. <laughs> Whoa, hey, we are in the Peruvian rainforest. <laughs> now there's all kinds of living things here like uh, animals and creepy crawlies and <laughs> my personal favorite. Frogs. <laughs> Click on my belly to meet some rainforest creatures and we can explore how they all live together. Yep. <laughs> Click on me for more animals. Whoa! <laughs> Ants like leftovers, yep, and they keep the rainforest very clean. Oh, a baby postman caterpillar. <laughs> she likes that passion vine. Ooh. <laughs> Who likes flowers? Ah! <laughs> Hello there, macaw! <laughs> hey! <laughs> Fresh fruit salad! Ooh, <laughs> tasty! Whoa! Ants like leftovers, yep. And they keep the rainforest very clean. Click on me for more animals. Hey! Morpho Cypress Caterpillar. <laughs> A leaf Katie did. <laughs> A natural at hide and seek. Yep. Whoa! <laughs> Do you think these creatures like each other? <laughs> well, let's see. Click on me for more and Whoa! Post 
Ghost Man Butterfly. <laughs> oh, she drinks from the passion flower, I think. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Oh, have you ever eaten this before? I don't know. <laughs> Emerald Green Boa. <laughs> he likes trees. Oh, I'm wasting away. Just look at me. Oh, could you feed me something, please? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who likes flower? A hummingbird. <laughs> oh, I bet you he's thirsty for flower nectar. Oh, that fruit bat is cute. <laughs> Let's hang him upside down. Hey, you want to leave the rainforest? Okay, let's go. So many marvelous creatures. Where to now? Good choice, buddy. Mix and match is just coming up, champ. Hold tight. <laughs> hey, Skipper. Let's get our ears cleaned out, and we'll be ready to play a musical round of mix and match. Which Peruvian instrument makes which sound? Let's find out. Just press go, and we're ready to start. Go! Okay, maestro. I'm going to play you a little bit of each instrument. There's a little musical note in the box below me. It'll play a note for you. You drag the note to the person you think makes that sound. But hey, if you click on a musician first, you can hear their sound and match it like that. Maybe here? Bumble. Zamponia. Tambourine. Kina. Flyertista. Maracas. Pincuyo. Boy, oh boy, nice work. I couldn't have done it better myself. Ready to go again? If you click on the kid, we'll make it harder. And click the stopwatch to play Beat the Clock. What a gig, champ. Nice work. Where'd the others go? That was quite a fanfare, Chester. <laughs> now where should we go? Off to Norway! Ha ha ha! Aha! Beautiful Norway and its myriad waterways, fjords, Norway's lovely lakes, and the cold, cold North Sea. Brrr. I bet you'd like a little skiing. Pick me and we're off to the snow. Yep. Hey, wait up. It's tricky hopping in the snow. <laughs> hey, <laughs> wait a sec. We'll be playing in no time. 
Mm -hmm. Hey, we are up in the snowy mountains of Norway, and we get to play winter sports, yeah. <laughs> and look, there's a lake and a ski jump, too. Yeah, cool. <laughs> you're going to meet the local boys and girls, and uh, <laughs> you're not going to believe it till you see them. Trolls, yeah, honest. <laughs> now, trolls are like uh, weird, fantastical folks that live in Norway. Yep. <laughs> I'll click on my belly to meet everyone and get some snow stuff to play with, yeah. <laughs> Hey, a dancing troll. <laughs> he can dance, but can he ski? Woo! <laughs> it's even more fun with skis. Yeah. Hey, skates for skating on the lake. Hey. <laughs> All ready for skating on the lake. Wanna go ice fishing? <laughs> Just go over to the hole in the lake. Hold, troll. <laughs> One minute she's normal, the next, well, <laughs> uh, you'll see. <laughs> oh, run! How about taking a troll sledding? <laughs> All ready for skating on the lake. Hey, <laughs> who wants to skate on the lake? <laughs> Remember to find skates. Oh, this is Astrid. <laughs> she likes to dance. Yeah. Want to go ice fishing? <laughs> Just go over to the hole in the lake. Whoa, a lake troll! Hey, <laughs> bring someone here for skating. Yeah. How about taking a troll sledding? <laughs> Rolf, <laughs> betcha he'd like to go fishing. Yep. <laughs> Wanna roll a troll down the hill? <laughs> go on. <laughs> it's fun. Want to go ice fishing? <laughs> Just go over to the hole in the lake. Oh, want to see a reindeer pull the sled? <laughs> she can, you know. Hey, <laughs> a sled! <laughs> Who wants a ride? Oh, want to see a reindeer pull the sled? Okay. <laughs> Wanna roll a troll down the hill? <laughs> Go on, <laughs> it's fun. Oh, wanna see a reindeer pull? <laughs> wanna go ice fishing? <laughs> Just go over to the hole in the lake. Oh, kicking troll, watch out! Oh no! <laughs> Skis! 
Wanna get someone to ski down the hill? <laughs> hey, hey, <laughs> I got an idea. <laughs> Let's ski jump. All ready to ski down the hill? Oh, here's Lars. <laughs> he looks ready for a snowball fight. Yeah. Reindeer. <laughs> Just like Santa's. <laughs> oh, they live around Norway, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Can you feed me some of that stuff, please? Oh, yeah, please. Oh, I'm beat. Yep. Uh, let's find the others. Hey, where'd they go? I love those poke and prods. Ingenious! What now, though? <laughs> oh, what an honor! Story on its way. Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then, when it's all ready, we'll begin. Among the dark forests and steep mountains of Norway, there once lived a happy troll family named the Fosogrimans, who made their home behind a beautiful waterfall. Mama Fosogrimen and her children spent their days joyfully, for Mama had taught them to play the violin, and their music rang out over the mountain tops. Unfortunately, they lived on the same mountain, a dangerous troll whose name was Mountain Troll. Who is making that happy music? demanded Mountain Troll. One brave rabbit inched forward and said, uh, Mama, Fuzzy Greeman and, and her children, they, they're celebrating the first buds of spring? That's the most disgusting thing I've ever heard! The hideous troll stomped his club foot three times. <laughs> and a thundering roar began. Down the mountain raced a terrible avalanche toward Mama Fuzzy Greeman and her children. When the dust cleared, their beloved waterfall was a mere trickle. Mountain troll! That pile of filth! exclaimed Mama Fosogrim and hotly, for she knew well where to place the blame. He shan't rest until we are all as unhappy as he! Well, I can't abide by that! Mama Fosogrim quickly packed a suitcase. Her dark determination worried Eric, her eldest. Mama, where are you going? To China! To see the all-powerful phoenix, one must fight fire with fire. But I'll need your dear father's magic violin for protection. Papa's violin? Uh, sure. But Eric, being a teenage troll, had no idea where he had last placed the precious instrument. I it's here, uh, somewhere. Your eyes are sharp and bright. Can you help Mama find the violin? <laughs> I'm not a violin. <laughs> White coral bells upon a slender stalk. You'd have to hide a violin behind something bigger than me. I knew you'd think I took it! Well, I didn't! See? So there! Oh, you mean this magic violin? Sorry, Mama. I'll thank you to hand that to me, young man. Little Lars Fosagreeman sheepishly handed the violin to his mother and 
decided not to tell her he had been using it as a snowshoe. As Momo set off down the road, she barked out final orders to her brood. No parties! No pummeling the little ones! And be sure to put the badger out at night! As she turned the last corner and was gone, the young fossil grimmins let loose. Yes! <laughs> and the naughty children broke into the sugar barrel and emptied it down their throats. Meanwhile, Mama hitched a ride on the Orient Express across Siberia to China. Reaching the plains of central China, she leaped bravely from the moving train and made her way to the Emperor's palace on foot. Days later, a tired Mama Fosugrimin entered the royal fruit orchard, but alas, she was unable to pick out the phoenix. For though she had heard many stories of the creature and its fantastic powers, she had never actually seen one. How about you? Would you help Mama Force Agreement find the phoenix in the scene? The phoenix is hard to find when she wants to be. <laughs> Ribbit. What is it with you people? Do I look like a phoenix? No. Do I act like a phoenix? No. <laughs> Ribbit. Whippy, whippy, woo, woo, woo. Our phoenix is hiding from you, you, you. You wish to speak to me? Mama Force Agreement wasted no time in recounting the horrors Mountain Troll had bestowed upon her beleaguered family. What is it you wish me to do? Asked the bird, quite naturally. I want you to make him see he's done wrong. Make him right the river's course and return our waterfall to us. But surely, you know, I can only change those who wish for change. As long as his heart is hard, love cannot affect his actions. Why don't you bribe him? The phoenix handed Mama a feather necklace so lovely that one glance made the onlooker covet it for themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. She curtsied politely and hurried out of the orchard, hoping to catch the Orient Express on its northern return. But alas, she had not gone far when she was accosted by a band of hill trolls, little goblins who had followed her from Norway. Grabbing the feather necklace, they stuffed poor Mama in a burlap bag. Quiet, quiet, or we'll eat you up! And deposited her in the hold of a freighter bound for India. So long, lady. <laughs> she spent the long ocean crossing on a pile of peaches, playing sprightly sea ditties on her late husband's violin. Once in India, Mama and the peaches were enjoying an overland trek to Calcutta when a large rat sent her sailing off the wagon. Whee! Oh! Mama Force Agreement found herself stranded in the dense jungle of India. How would she ever get home? Suddenly, the ground began to shake around her. Thundering past from every direction came tigers and elephants and camels. Mama was swooped up by a camel. Where, where are we going? We've been summoned! On they ran, at full gallop, toward the court of the Monkey King. Welcome, Mammalia! <coughs> <coughs> I'll come right to the point. I have a really bad cold. The Monkey King declared, coughing loud and long. <laughs> <laughs> I've been advised that I need vitamin C to save myself from further demise. Anyone who can bring me this vitamin C shall be rewarded with as much gold as they can carry. <laughs> <laughs> the King sat back to watch the ensuing chaos. Mama was as anxious as anyone to find this mysterious vitamin C, for gold would be just the thing to bribe the evil mountain troll. Vitamin C? Hmm. I know it's something you eat. It must be in certain plants or animals, but mm, which ones? Can you help Mama Fosun Grinnan find a plant or animal that has lots of vitamin C? Be careful that you don't bring too much sunshine upon Mama Troll, because too much sunshine can turn a troll to stone. Oh my, oh dear, please, you must do something! 
so so good to see see you. Of course, my natural beauty makes you curious about me. So so good to see see you. Uh oh. Rolls do not like this sun, and to get away from it, Mama Fosagrimen was forced to hide from its rays and ran all the way back to Norway under her umbrella, without the Monkey King's gold. Alas, the poor troll family was not able to bribe the nasty mountain troll into restoring their waterfall. They were forced to move to a tiny tree stump, where to this day they wait for someone to help them win the Monkey King's gold. Perhaps I'll rest my paws a bit while you play with one of the others. Oh, nice pickin'. Nice pickin' indeed. Mix and match is just coming up, champ. Hold tight. <laughs> hey, Skipper. It's Christmas time in Norway, and we've got some Nordic mix and matching to do. Do you want to help me get finished for the Christmas celebrations? Go! Okay, sport. Skis. And we're off. Yarn doll. Mittens. Oh, an angel. Stocking. A witch. Clogs. Well done, champ. Well done. Fancy some more? Let's play again. Chester, Chester, Chester. <laughs> oh, Honey Blossom, I'm very flattered. Thank you. <coughs> Darling, you just sit tight while I get my things together for this. Mm. Ahoy there, sugar. We're about to sail into the history of magical Norway. So hang on tight and let's get ready to play... Velma's Fact or Fib. Norway has lots of snow and mountains, the perfect condition for skiing. And it's a good thing, too, because Norwegians, well, they're born with skis on their feet. Now, does that sound like a fact or a fib, honeybee? <laughs> oh, you are a whiz, kid. Oh, you smarty pants. They really aren't born with skis, but plenty of them certainly learn to ski at a young age. Oh, yeah. You see, skiing's been popular in Norway for ages. In fact, long ago, Norwegians actually used large animal bones strapped to their feet as skis. Oh my, oh that's amazing. <laughs> Click up. Bet you can't guess what time it is in this picture. Midnight! That's right. During the summer, the sun never goes down in Norway. It shines day and night. Now what's your verdict, honey? Does that sound like a fact or a fib? Well, you're right as rain, sugar pie. The sun stays up all summer long. That is because the Earth rotates on an angle, and Norway, being near the top of the world, is tilted toward the sun in the summer and away from it in the winter. Which means come December, Norwegians don't see hiding or hair the sun for two whole months. The Vikings, who lived in Norway a long time ago, were as brave and clever as warriors come. Fact, one of the bravest among them was a king who went by the name Ragnar Lodbrok. Now you guess what Lodbrok translates as. Hairy britches. <laughs> now what do you think, Pumpkin? Is that a fact or a fib? Oh my, my, you do know your Vikings. Nice job. There most certainly was a king named Ragnar Lodbrok. You see, old Ragnar was in love with this princess named Thora, who lived in a castle surrounded by a giant moat filled with poisonous snakes. And he got past the snakes by wading through the moat dressed in animal skins, with the fur side out, hence the name Hairy Britches. Click on any picture. These fellas are known as Vikings. They were sailor warriors who lived in Norway, oh, a long, long time ago. In fact, they were such good sailors, they were some of the very first Europeans to visit North America, even before Columbus. Now that's your call, honey. Am I affecting or fibbing? Oh, you betcha, bunny. It's a fact.
Those Vikings had the whole sailing thing down cold. They used large sails as well as oars <laughs> when there was no wind. And they knew how to store vats of water and butter, cheese, smoked fish, apples, and nuts for really long voyages, like the ones that took them all the way to America. Pick a fa- Did you know that Norway is chock full of trolls? Oh, this nasty looking fella is called Tanverk Trollet. And it's a good thing that he only lives in Norway, cause he likes nothing better than to burrow into the teeth of children who forget to brush and make himself a nice comfy home. Huh. Now what's your verdict, hun? Is that a fact or a fib? Well, well, that fib alarm's working like a charm. You're right, sweetie pie. Trolls are just pretend creatures. But Norwegians sure love to tell stories about them. <laughs> yeah, they come in all shapes and sizes. But most of them are mean and grumpy and live in dark, scary caves and only come out at night to do their mischief. Click on anyone and we... Hey, have you ever seen a reindeer? Well, you would in northern Norway, because that's where reindeers live. <laughs> And there's a special group of people whose whole lives are spent herding the reindeer and following them from pasture to pasture. Now, what do you think about that, Lamb Chop? Is that a fact or is that a fit? <laughs> oh, you are darn tootin' it's true. The Sami people have been following reindeer around for hundreds of years. Even their homes can be dismantled at the drop of a hat. Those homes, they're known as lavos, and they're made with wooden poles wrapped in reindeer hides and they've learned how to pick up and go whenever the herd gets antsy. Click on any picture and off. Well, we've been chilling and thrilling up here with those facts. Let's kick off the snow and see what the gang's up to. Vilma must have... You'll like this stuff, I promise. Hang on, please. We're just getting ready. Hmm? I've been boating around Norway with my camera. Just wait till I show you the photos. If you want to see all the sights of Norway, you're gonna have to float, so you better take a boat. If you want to visit our fjords and mountains, it's a lovely trip, but you better take a ship. Come and see the friendly folks of Norway. You'll be glad you came along. And you might see a troll or a reindeer or you want to go now? What a wonderful set of photographic souvenirs of our world tour. Can we find something just as good to do now? Mexico? Ho! Ho 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 ho! Mexico. A whole world to discover in one beautiful country. Welcome, my friend, to Mexico. Chester's struggling with Spanish lessons. I bet you can help. Whee! Off we go! Hang on, please. We're just getting ready. Hmm? It's a good thing I had color film in my camera. Mexico is so colorful. These are the colors of Mexico. Rojo y blanco y verde. Red, white, and green are the colors you've seen. That monkey Sue has an eye for a colorful picture and an ear for a colorful tune. What shall we do now? Good choice, picking your old pal Chester. Mix and match is just coming up, champ. Hold tight. <laughs> Hola, Skipper. That's Spanish for howdy, Skipper. We're in Mexico, and you'll be jumping like a Mexican jumping bean and learning some Spanish, too. Press go to get us started. Go! See the word below me? It's Spanish. That's the language here in Mexico. And it's a word for something in the picture. Look in the picture for it, and then drag the word across to it. 
Los tomates. Las. El sol. What's the El sol. What's the hottest thing around? El maíz. With this, you can make flour or oil or a snack for the movies. El maíz. With this, you can make El maíz. La guitarra. El sombrero. El cacto. Thorny. Now that's piecing things together, sport. Nice job. Too easy? Well, if you click on... Gotta go? Adios! Bye! Super bueno! Now where to, my friend? Hold on to your hats! We're off and away! Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then, when it's all ready, we'll begin! Long ago, in the land of the ancient Aztecs, there lived a young boy with a vibrant imagination. His name was Montezuma, and he often spent his days alone, for the other children were frightened by the size of his dreams. One day, as he stared up toward the island of the sun, Montezuma found himself thinking, I wish I had some friends, real friends, who like to imagine things just like I do. The idea had barely been born when Montezuma heard a strange rustling. Who are you? gasped the boy to the odd-looking person that sprang up beside him. I? <laughs> Who am I? I am Quetzalcoatl, the great creator spirit of all the Aztecs. You asked for more friends, didn't you? Before Montezuma could answer, Quetzalcoatl was interrupted by a bird that flashed into existence next to his ear. And she needs this right now? The little bird seemed to think so. So Quetzalcoatl turned to Montezuma and said with great solemnity, How about a rain check? As the spirit dissolved, he made one request of the boy. While I'm handling this other matter, go get yourself the hard shell of a great sea turtle. We're gonna need one. But how am I to... Ask my namesake! She lives around here. She owes me! With that, Quetzalcoatl popped back to the great beyond, and Montezuma looked round him with a searching eye. Can you help him find Quetzalcoatl's namesake? He's gonna be harder than you think. <laughs> So bad. Pick it up. It's magic. Montezuma hesitated, but the bird insisted. Oh, boy of the small-minded humans, this feather will do your bidding. Now close your eyes and set your mind free. What do you see? I see a gigantic creature with a long and mighty nose. Use the feather to draw it in the air. As the boy outlined his vision, nothingness changed to somethingness. Keep going! Keep going! Montezuma finished the strange creature and rapidly drew a world around it. It's working! It's incredible! Of course it is! But take heed! You must not step into the image or else... But the Quetzal's warning came too late, and Montezuma had stepped into the image and now found himself in a different place entirely. Where am I? he asked. But the answer would have to wait. The elephant thundered to the jungle, ramming everything in sight. Montezuma hid behind a palm tree, wondering how he could calm the elephant. Perhaps you can find what he needs. Oh my, oh dear, please, you must do something! Look up, guys! See what you see! When they get this way, they're impossible. 
you need to get on his good side. <laughs> Warm him up a bit. Maybe he'll just burn himself out. This should help. It worked like a charm last time. As the sun slipped close to the earth, Montezuma felt the air boil up around him. The young elephant tired quickly in this heat and soon fell asleep. You did it! exclaimed the boy as the sun bounced back to a proper position. So grateful was the jungle kingdom that upon hearing of Montezuma's search for the turtle shell, the monkey king lent the boy his chariot and told him to go to Japan, for the animals felt certain he could find his turtle shell there. Thank you, thank you very much, said Montezuma, still clutching the magic feather. He slapped the reins gently and hurtled northward at top speed, propelled by the might of two Bengal tigers. Unfortunately, when they reached the Asian shore, they came to a screeching halt, catapulting Montezuma into the Sea of Japan and landing him squarely in the lap of an underwater dragon king. Hello there! Do you sing harmony? The boy shook his head and asked the king if he had seen a giant sea turtle. Oh, oh lordy, yes! He howls me constantly! Thinks I owe him a pension for some great deed he did! <laughs> Look around! I I'm sure he's here somewhere! Montezuma surveyed the underwater kingdom, but the turtle was not to be found. Where do you think a giant sea turtle would hide? Be careful not to disturb the dangerous jellyfish in your search. Oh no! The dangerous jellyfish has been disturbed! Look, it's nothing personal, but I don't like people poking at me! Its powerful sting sent Montezuma flying out of the water with such force that he dropped his magic feather. He landed on a deserted island, but he was alone, without friends or his magic feather. And to this day, he waits there, hoping someone will come to help him return home. Day of the Dead! Whatever next? Yes, whatever shall we do next? Oh, I thought you'd never ask. Darling, you just sit tight while I get my things together for this. Boy, oh boy, do I ever have a hat full of sizzling facts for you on sunny Mexico. So slather on some of that fib block, cause we're about to play... Velma's Fact or Fib. You've got your choice of six spicy Mexico facts. But bear in mind, there's a fib or two hiding among this bunch. You see this sweet little old doggie? She is a Xolochicuatli, or a Mexican hairless. Oh, she's not born this way, though. No siree. Every morning, her faithful owner has to give her a good clip and a shave. Why, if left on her own, she'd have hair up to 20 feet long. Now, what do you think, sweetie? Is that a fact or a fib? Oh, I see I can't fool you. Why, there's no need to give these cutie pies a haircut every morning, because they're actually born without hair. And without hair, this doggy feels very warm. So warm that they're often used to heat their owner's bed. Come on now, pick a fact, pumpkin, and we'll get going. Now, y'all may have heard of the Aztecs, an ancient civilization that flourished in southern Mexico thousands of years ago. They built huge pyramids, lived in big cities, and made beautiful art. But did you know they also played a game that was kind of like basketball? Pick your poison, doll. Fact or fib? Hey, put her there, pumpkin. You're absolutely right. The Aztecs really did play a game similar to basketball that they called Tlachtli. You had to get the ball through rings cut out of high stone walls. And the hardest part about Tlachtli, however, aside from saying it, was you couldn't use your hands or feet, only your shoulders, your knees, and your hips. Pick a fact and we'll get going.
I'll bet you didn't know that each November in Mexico, all the skeletons of dead people rise up out of their graves and have a party. They ride bicycles, play drums, and even get married. Your call, Honey Bunch. Does that sound like a fact or a fib? <laughs> nice job, Sugar. You sure know how to sniff out a fib. Now, although Mexicans celebrate with paper mache skeletons, the real skeletons stay put during the celebration known as Los Dias de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. Oh, it's a happy time when families remember those who have died by sprucing up all the grave sites in the cemetery and having a picnic. Click on any one, and this is how Mexico City looks today. It's the fourth largest city in the whole world, with big old streets and more than 10 million people. But strange as this may sound, most of Mexico City used to be underwater. Now what do you think, sugar pie? Is that a fact or a fib? Oh, oh dear, wouldn't you know it, there really was water there. See, back when the Aztecs first built Mexico City, then known as Tenochtitlan, it was constructed on an island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. But once the Spanish invaders conquered the Aztecs, they drained the lake and began building the town that we know today as Mexico City. Click on any picture. During the winter months, the monarch butterfly drives a big old Buick down to Mexico to get out of the cold weather. Once there, the butterfly really whoops it up and gets in lots of trouble with the local policia. So what do you think, sweetie pie? Is that a fact or is that a fib? Well, hey, you are one smart cookie. Monarch butterflies do like to get out of the cold, but they don't drive to Mexico. They fly. And they're long-distance champs, too, sometimes flying up to 2,000 miles. Why, they fly in big old groups, covering the sky with their beautiful black and orange wings. Click on any picture and we'll... That prickly looking plant is called a cactus and they grow all over Mexico. Now you sure don't want to touch them because those little spines, oh, they hurt like the dickens. But did you know that you can eat cactus? Oh, now what do you think? Factor fib. <laughs> oh, you must be wearing your thinking sombrero. That's right, you can eat a cactus. And many people in Mexico do eat certain kinds of cactus. Of course, you gotta scrape the spines off first. And not only that, Mexicans use cactus in other ways too, like grinding up the seeds for cake meal or, or making red food dye from the flowers. Click on any one and we'll get me. Well, those fibs had you jumping like a Mexican jumping bean. But what do you say we go and find the others now? The fib machine's been working overtime. Let's give it a break and trot along to another activity. Okay, let's go. Hey, <laughs> wait a sec. We'll be playing in no time. <laughs> Whoa, hey, guess what? <laughs> it's Marta's fifth birthday, <laughs> and we get to throw her a traditional Mexican birthday party <laughs> with a piñata. <laughs> oh, that is the uh, straw thingamabob hanging from the ceiling? Yeah. <laughs> First, we'll stuff it with all kinds of special things, and then we play a game where we try to break it open by hitting it with a stick. No kidding. <laughs> so click on my belly, and we'll get going. A whistle. Beep. <laughs> For blowing and putting in the piñata. A trumpet. <laughs> Wanna put that in the piñata? Oh, a present. <laughs> Will you give it to Mara to open it? Oh, I bet you could squeeze something else in. Go on. Yeah. Stuff it. Oh, we can put that present in the pinata. A ball. <laughs> boing, boing, boing. 
呃。Oh, a doll. Ah, oh, but you could squeeze something else. Go on. I bet you next time you'll do it. Yep. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> what a party! <laughs> bye bye, Maida. Feliz cumpleaños. <laughs> Happy birthday. Little Bungie has a belly full of amazing things. <laughs> now what shall we do? To Japan! Japan! <laughs> Here we are in Japan. The place where the mightiest samurai lives in a house with paper walls. Pick Monkey Sue here to work up an appetite. <laughs> oh, what an honor! Story on its way. Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then, when it's all ready, we'll begin. In an underwater kingdom off the coast of Japan, there once lived a strange and happy king. His name was Ryuwo, the Dragon King. Recently, the Dragon King had developed a habit that was particularly annoying to his subjects. He had become passionate about the music of the American cowboy. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play. The king was not a talented singer. Real Woe's most trusted attendant was an aging sea turtle, known simply as Turtle. Valiantly, Turtle did his best to see that the king's royal passion didn't interfere with his work. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies I'm turning are down the volume now, sire! But that was not enough to satisfy all of Ryu Wo's subject, the evil octopus Taco among them. Ryu Wo sings like a bumpkin. He doesn't deserve to rule. I should be king. And with that, Taco hatched a terrible plan. Sire, allow me to present you with a small token of my esteem. The octopus unveiled a giant clam claiming that deep inside it was a musical surprise. Musical? Really? <laughs> but, uh, I don't hear anything! As the king leaned into the clam, Taco slammed it shut with all eight of his arms! Help! Help! Oh, oh nice echo! La 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 Fool! Now I am king! Alarmed by this turn of events, Turtle began to search the kingdom for his friend Hanako the Crab, who happened to be a professional clam opener. But Turtle's eyesight is not good, and he moves so slow. Could you help him find the crab in this scene? Black, black, black. Better look at the expiration date. Uh, Turtle's my brother. <laughs> my vision's as bad as his. Uh, uh, excuse me. <laughs> no crabs here. <laughs> I'm just glad that guy stopped singing. Crabs seldom visit me. Check around the rocks. I'm soft and squishy, you see. Not hard on the outside like a crab. Where's that clam? Make way for the professional! Hanako 
pounced on this opportunity to be of service and attempted to pry open the clam with her most effective pincer techniques. Don't worry, Your Highness. I'll have you out of there in a... But try as she might, Hanako was unable to release Ryu Wo from the clam's firm grasp. No, what? demanded the turtle, with as much irritation as a tired turtle can muster. Meanwhile, Taco settled comfortably in the throne and put the entire kingdom to work, repainting the palace in a dictatorial gray. He laughed at Turtle. <laughs> that is a magic clam. The only way it can be opened is with the tooth of an Egyptian crocodile. <laughs> in addition to being cruel, Taco was an habitual liar. And what he had just told Turtle was exactly that. A lie. The tooth of an Egyptian crocodile? Well, come on, let's go! And with that, the young crab jumped on the turtle's aching back and urged him to swim south. When we hit Indonesia, take a right, cross the Indian Ocean, and go up through the Red Sea! Thus it was that Turtle found himself thrust on a long sea voyage without even the convenience of an overnight bag, which he could have used since old turtles swim very, very slowly. Uh, have you ever heard of a high gear turtle? Nope! replied Turtle, as he inched toward Egypt. Many seasons later, they arrived at their destination. Okay, let's see. A crocodile shouldn't be too hard to find. But the little crab's eyes were worse than Turtle's. Is it a, a big fuzzy-looking thing or a little fuzzy-looking thing? Oh, dear! How are your eyes? Can you find the crocodile? Yes, what is it? We need your tooth. What? Where did you get such an idea? The pair explained the dire situation to the king, to which the crocodile exclaimed, I'm afraid Taco misled you. My tooth is of no use to you. Misled us? You mean he lied? But it took us seven years to get here. Seven and a half, corrected Turtle, who suddenly felt very old. Fortunately, King Sebek did not leave them empty-handed. I know just what you need. A magical Peruvian hammer. It is a bit of a hike, but nothing compared to the journey you just took. Weary, but with no other options available, Turtle began the long swim to Peru. Hanako settled in for a nice long snooze on the turtle's wide back. Meanwhile, back home, the sea creatures had long since tired of their octopus king. My fins hurt! Everything's so drab around here! Can we stop working now? Silence, you miscreants! In their heart of hearts, the sea animals missed their odd but happy dragon king, who was wasting away in the clam, and they prayed for the safe return of Turtle, who could release them from their misery. Turtle, sensing that their destination was near, picked up his speed and at last, Hanako and Turtle arrived in Peru. Now where do you suppose one might find a magical hammer? They need your help, but whatever you do, do not disturb the mighty condor. I'm enticing, am I not? You never know, ever know where I might take you. I just saw the hammer. I think it's over near the bridge. If I had a hammer, man, I hammer in the morning, man. Yeah, just pound it down, man. I am hammer, hammer, man. The silver hammer turned out to be everything the turtle hoped it would be, and more. And like, bang, bang, that hammer came down upon his head, man. Bam, I hammer. Truly magic, the hammer already knew of Ryu Wu's predicament and decided to levitate them all back to Japan. Picked up uh, a little TM uh, back in the 60s. Uh, hang on, we're in the groove. Uh, uh, uh. As quick as one can say, karma, 
The hammer had returned them to their underwater home. But what a different place it was. Irritable from overwork, the sea creatures didn't even cheer their return. Where the heck have you been, huh? And where's that crocodile tooth? Fearing they had come too late, Turtle placed his good ear on the clam and listened for signs of life. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Toot, toot. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Toot, toot. He sounds pretty weak. We'd better hurry. Ha! <laughs> you are too late. He's been moaning that rot for weeks. Turtle grabbed the silver hammer, shouting, Stand back, everybody! Oh! Oh! Ho, 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 ho. Oh, please! Giggled the condescending octopus. Turning to the clamshell, Turtle tapped the hammer against it three times. <coughs> Silence filled the kingdom, and for a moment nothing happened. Then, the clamshell opened wide, and a weak but happy dragon king stuck out his royal head. Shall we? Coming round the mountain, she'll be coming round the mountain when she comes to toot. Joy and elation, yes, even song, erupted through the kingdom as real war was carried back to his throne. With Turtle by his side, the king once again found his voice. Oh, my darling! Oh, my darling! Oh, my darling, Clementine! and no one in the kingdom ever complained of it again. Dragons! I love dragons! Can you find something else here to do? I bet you can. Whee! Off we go! Hang on, please. We're just getting ready. Hmm? We're in Japan to hear about their delicious food. Let's have some rice, let's have it in a bowl. Or if you'd like, we can have a sushi roll. It's rice rolled in seaweed and vegetables too. It's fun to eat and good for you. Japanese rice comes from the countryside. It grows in the water, then it's picked and dried. If we plant it into flour, we can make a holiday treat called mochi rice cake. Let's have some carrots, pickles, and spice, ginger and tofu, and lots of rice. Wanna go? Okie dokie! I'm really quite hungry now. You too? <laughs> what can we do to take our minds off that? Take us somewhere! Cool! Hey, <laughs> wait a sec. We'll be playing in no time. <laughs> Oh, wow! <laughs> you know what we get to do? <laughs> we get to create our own Japanese garden <laughs> yeah, with special rocks and tiny trees called bonsai trees and uh, uh, some origami animals. <laughs> oh, those are made with folded paper. Yeah, yeah, true. Cross my heart. <laughs> Click on my belly and we'll see how green your thumbs are. <laughs> Mine are pretty green. <laughs> I'm a frog. <laughs> Stones. Find somewhere to put these stones. Yep, go on. A lantern. Oh, this is an origami koi. <laughs> that is a fish made of folded paper. <laughs> Can you make her swim? Hey! Oh. Oh, a baby tree seedling. Oh, it'll grow with some water.
Hey, <laughs> I have an idea. Let's give this some water. Wanna Aw, cute paper bunny. <laughs> what will the magic cage do to her? Hmm. Cool. Hey, wow. Awful. Oh, a seedling. Hey, I bet you this'll grow into a bonsai tree if you plant it in a pot. Hey, stones! <laughs> Can you make a stone garden? Oh, the magic cage only works for animals. Yep. Hey, stone! Good job! Hey, stone! <laughs> Can you... Very nice landscaping, very nice. Oh, monkey! <laughs> this one's made with origami. <laughs> what? Cool! Delish! Hey, stone! <laughs> Can you make a stone? Oh, now all it needs is a stone bridge. Yeah. Oh, a seedling. Oh. Very nice land. Oh. Sayonara! Oh, <laughs> that's Japanese for see ya. <laughs> Come on, let's find the others, okay? What a garden. I've never seen anything like it. Where to now? Oh, bless you, darling. You chose me. Oh, I'm very touched. Darling, you just sit tight while I get my things together for this. Hey, you sugar pie. The fantastic island nation of Japan is our next port of call. So let's flex those fib finding fingers and play Velma's Fact or Fib. Be sure to keep your eyes and ears peeled, because old Velma's planted a fib or two in all those juicy Japanese facts. This may kind of look like a giant beehive, but it's not. No, it's called a capsule hotel, and it has some of the smallest rooms in the world. In Japan, you see, some people, um, mainly businessmen, actually spend the night in these tiny little itty-bitty rooms. Now, what do you say, doll? Am I feeding you a fact or serving you up a big old fib? <laughs> it's true. Yeah. You see, Japan has some of the most crowded cities on Earth. And capsule hotels help save on space while giving lots of businessmen an inexpensive place to sleep. 
These teeny little hotel rooms are just big enough to lie down in. But even though they're tight quarters, doesn't mean they skimp on comfort. Oh, no siree. Each one comes equipped with its own reading light, a radio, and even a mini TV. Come on now, pick a fact, punk. This lady's an armor. A diving fisherwoman of Japan. She dives down more than 100 times a day to collect abalone from the rocks beneath the sea. Why, did you know that in Japan only a woman could be an ama? Now, is that the gospel pumpkin? Or am I handing you a nice big old fib? Oh. oh dear, that ain't no fib, darling. Nope, it's the truth. Believe it or not, girls have been diving off the coast of Japan for more than 2,000 years. And the reason is not just tradition, either. Oh, no. You see, our bodies make us gals better suited for that line of work. We can handle the effects of working in cold water a lot longer than most men. Did you know that some Japanese grow bonsai forests inside their homes? Why, well, sometimes things can get so crowded with all those trees that they have to move the furniture up into the branches. Now, honey, am I pulling the wool over your eyes? Or is that a fact? Well, your fib finder's working like a charm. Good job. See, bonsai means tiny tree, and it's a special art form in Japan. You see, they take what would normally be a big tree, and they trim it and prune it so that it stays small. So small, in fact, that you can hold it in your hand. Why, they can even grow teeny tiny apple trees that bear fruit. Go on and pick a fa This fella here, he's a Japanese sumo wrestler. Now, sumo wrestlers have a special diet, and they have to eat lots and lots of meals a day. And to make sure that they eat enough food, their trainers rub the wrestlers' tummies so they can eat more. Now, what do you think, Lamb Chop? Is that a fact, or is that a fib? <laughs> oh, my, my, you got that exactly right. Yes, sumo wrestlers eat a special high-protein diet, and they can weigh up to 380 pounds. They need to be heavy, too, since the idea of sumo wrestling is to try to push your opponent out of the ring. Come on now, did you know that many Japanese people are allergic to water? Fact, instead of a regular bath, they invented a dry cleaning powder that helps them avoid water altogether. Now you tell me, doll, is that a fact or is that a big old fib? <laughs> well, you sure know how to sniff out a fib, don't you? Truth is, Japanese love water just as much as you and me, especially baths. Fact, long soakers are so popular, they have public baths so you can soak with your friends. These baths are as big as swimming pools, only the water's really hot and there is no swimming allowed. Click on any pic. The Japanese people eat lots of interesting foods, but there is one traditional delicacy that is very dangerous. It's a type of sushi called puffer fish, or fugu. Puffer fish are poisonous, and if you eat the wrong part of them, it could kill you. Fact or fib, darling, now you tell me. <laughs> Holy Toledo, that is right. Yes, you are right. The Japanese do eat puffer fish, but fugu is best prepared by expert chefs who are specially trained to separate the poisonous parts from the good stuff. So you have to be careful. Oh, my sweet angel, oh, my, I am just a flutter after all those facts. Why, you could use me as a Japanese fan. <laughs> but hey, sugar, I say we should go and find the rest of the gang now. Velma, I can safely say that that was fib-tabulous. <laughs> what activity shall we try now, my friend? Oh, nice picking. Nice picking indeed. <coughs> Mix and match is just coming up, champ. Hold tight. <laughs> hey, Skipper! Today is the Big Boys Day fish hunt. Japanese honor their young sons with paper carp kites, which they hang on bamboo poles from the roof. Just press go! Go! Okay, then. I need you to help me match each fish kite to the right boy. Do you think you can do it? I've got a fish swimming in the box below me. You drag it to a boy where the pattern on the fish matches his shirt. Where do these match? Where do these... I've got spot... Where do these match? Laugh. 
Three stra- Weird Three st Full house! Well done! More fish and fun? Great! Let's play again! Good going all around, Scout! We'll come carp fishing again soon, huh? He always manages to get someone else to do the work. <laughs> what shall we do now, my friend? Yes! To India! Ha 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 ha! Aha! Beautiful India! Land of elephants, the ruling Maharajas, and a fine cup of tea. <laughs> Welcome, my friends! Welcome! Wanna paint an elephant? Choose me! You'll like this stuff, I promise! Hang on, please. We're just getting ready. Hmm? Hop up on an elephant and we're on our way! Let us ride up on an elephant. We can ride just like the kings and queens. We'll see palaces as white as clouds. Riding way up high above the crowd. Ladies dressed in silver, gold and pink. Dressed in saris working by the river. Let's go riding through the painted town. It's fun to ride an elephant around. I love to ride my elephant around. Silly me, is it time Such to go already? Photographs. Well done, Monkey Sue. Hmm. What shall we discover next? Oh, I thought you'd never ask. <coughs> darling, you just sit tight while I get my things together for this. Mm. Hey, darling, I've forged a trail through the tallest jungle grass to discover some amazing facts on exotic India. So start up that fib detector and let's get ready to play Velma's Fact or Fib. Now, a fact is a fact unless it's a fib, and I've planted a couple of tall tails in here, so y'all keep your eyes peeled. Now here we go. Click on any one of my India facts and we'll get started. Did you know that outside the big cities, if you need to see a dentist or a doctor, all you have to do is walk down the street? All kinds of doctors and dentists have their offices right out in the open on the sidewalks. Now is this Velma feeding you a fact or a big old fib? Well, you are sharp as a tack. That's exactly right. Street doctors are a common sight in small towns all over India. You can visit a dentist, a foot doctor, and even a doctor that'll give you herbs to cure your cold right on the old sidewalk. Click on any one, and you know, it seems like everything in India gets decorated somehow, from camels and elephants to palaces and fabric. Fact is, Indian women like adornment so much that when a young bride gets married, she spends all night decorating her hands with a special dye that lasts for weeks. Fib or hard fact, honey? You decide. You're right! Why, yes indeed. Indian brides not only wear a special red and gold sari and all their finest jewels, they also use a special dye from the henna plant and paint beautiful decorations on their hands and feet that look like the finest lace gloves and stockings. Now this dye lasts a few weeks, but while it's visible, the new bride is a lady of leisure and doesn't have to do a lick of housework. <laughs> Click on any picture and we'll... This lady's practicing yoga, an ancient form of exercise that benefits the mind and body. And yogis, uh, people who practice yoga, can relax themselves so much they can twist their bodies into all kinds of unusual shapes. Now, does that sound like a fib? Or is that a fact? <laughs> oh, my, my. You hit that nail right on the head. Good job. Not only that, yoga can give you more control over your body and allow you to withstand extreme heat and cold. In fact, some yogis get so good at controlling their breathing and their heart rate that they can be buried alive without suffering any ill effects. Well, for short periods of time, of course. <laughs>
This fella, he's a snake charmer, and he's actually able to tame poisonous king cobras. You see, the cobra listens with his extra sensitive ears to the beautiful music the charmer plays and falls into a trance. Your call, Lamb Chop. Does that sound like a fact or a big old fib? Oh, nothing gets by you, does it? No, you are right. Although there really are snake charmers, and they really do play flutes, the snakes can't hear the sounds because they don't have ears. <laughs> what the snakes are actually responding to are the charmers' movements. Did you know that in India, cows are allowed to roam anywhere they please? Even in crowded cities, cows can sit right down in the middle of the street, and cars and taxis and bicycles will wait patiently for the cows to move rather than disturb them. Now, does that sound like a fib, or is that a fact? <laughs> My goodness, you are a real India expert. That is 100% correct. Yes, indeed. Cows do roam free. You see, the way the Indians see it, children have always needed milk to grow strong and healthy. And since cows give milk, they've become a symbol for everything good and gentle in the universe. Elephants have been used as work animals in India for thousands of years. But did you know that Indian boys are given the big-time responsibility of caring for and training baby elephants? And often, these young trainers and their four-legged charges are together for their whole lives. Oh, pick your poison, darling. Now, is that a fact? Or is that an elephant-sized fib? <laughs> You're darn tootin' that's a fact. The two of them actually grow up together. Of course, the elephant's serious training doesn't start till he's about 14 years old, and he won't be doing real heavy work till he's almost 25. Click on any picture and, hey, darling, let's grab the next elephant out of here, okay? It's time to mosey off with the others. My brain is well sizzled. Is yours? <laughs> and now, what shall we do, huh? Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Hey, uh, wait a sec. We'll be playing in no time. <laughs> Whoa! Hey, here we are at the Pongal Festival with my friends Prano and Vishal. Hey! Now, <laughs> do you know what we get to do? Paint and decorate animals and feed them rice to celebrate the rice harvest. Yeah! <laughs> Click on my belly for animals to play with and then uh, 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 set the decorations on the festivizer. Then give the animals to Prano and Vishal and... Woohoo! A decorated animal! Yeah! A cow! <laughs> oh, cows are very special in India. <laughs> yes, they are sacred. Yep. Oh, she'd look nice if you decorate her. Oh, this is for making them move. Balloons! That is for coloring animals. Yep. Oh, oh, that animal looks, oh, that animal looks great. Oh, yeah. Hey, soap! Who needs cleaning, huh? Oh, look out now. Oh, an elephant. Huh, big nose. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's for choosing your flowers. Yep, uh-huh. Red. <laughs> oh! Pardon me. Hey, look! A magic carpet. Ooh. Oh, a sweet bee hen. <laughs> Blue! That is a blue. Hey, let's...
Let's give her the V-shell. Oh, time to go. Okay. Bye, V-shell. Bye-bye, Prano. Huh. See you soon. Bye-bye. Fabulous animal festivizing with our little bungee. But where should we go now? You chose Rapu. Good choice. Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then, when it's all ready, we'll begin. Once, in the jungles of India, there lived a mischievous monkey king named Hanuman, who had everything. Every whim and desire had been indulged since birth, and now Hanuman tired of his royal privilege. Oh, I am so bored! Bored, bored, bored! Chai, be a deer and scratch my baby toe, said Hanuman to the rhino who waited breathlessly to serve him. Looking down at this display was the wise old elephant, Ganesh. If your highness were to attend the pressing needs of his subjects, I do not think he would be bored. Oh, Ganesh, you're such a poop! snapped the monkey king as he leaned back to watch the sun sprinkle its new light across the sky. What's for breakfast? <laughs> Whatever your heart desires, my lord. What? Again? I've had it up to here with my heart's desire! The more the rhino tried to please, the angrier the monkey became. No! 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 Hanuman stopped and stared greedily at the morning sun. And before anyone could stop him, the little monkey reached up and popped it into his mouth. All of the jungle cried out, <coughs> Dusk fell on the world, and Hanuman's stomach began to sizzle and steam. Ow! 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 Hot! Hot! <gasps> do somebody, somebody, do something! The king's subjects looked from one to the other. Finally, Ganesh suggested coconut milk. It may soothe his stomach. Yes, yes, coconut milk! Hurry, hurry, everybody! But with no sun to light the way, Ganesh had difficulty finding a coconut. Maybe you could help him look for this useful fruit. He needs our help. Well, well, well. <laughs> look down! Look down! Look down! <laughs> if you want, I could squeeze the sun out of him. <laughs> you don't think I'm hiding a coconut? Oh, all right. I thought I'd give Hanuman a taste of his own medicine. Here you go. Hanuman opened his mouth, and Ganesh poured the creamy white liquid down his throat. <coughs> but alas, the milk had no effect, and it dawned on the animals that Hanuman had changed their lives forever. You simpering simian! You putrid primate! Look what you've done to us! <coughs> It is true, Hanuman has led us astray, but it is also true that he is a child of the jungle, and we must help him. We must find a magic fruit that will soothe his belly. I, myself, will go look for it, said the noble elephant, with a characteristic swish of his tail, and off he went, traveling west, unsure of his destination, but certain of his mission. Hurry back! But magic fruit are hard to find, and Ganesh searched far and wide before collapsing in the West African nation of Ghana. Oh, I can't go on. I have failed our king. Whoa, 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 what am I hearing here? Came a mysterious voice from somewhere nearby. Ganesh, Ganesh, the greatest of the great in the elephant department is defeated? Now, do not my trusty ears deceive me? The elephant looked out into the darkness, for the sun was gone in Ghana, too. Who's there? Do you think you can help Ganesh find this mysterious creature? Come on, come on, give it a try. You won't be sorry.
Hey, I got a flash. Look down some of my rows. Looking for a mysterious voice, eh? Those are tough. Mmm, it wasn't me. But you're getting warmer. Shoo! Shoo, you rat! You shoo! Go on! So, uh, I hear you're looking for a cooling fruit drink, huh? Ganesh nodded. Gee, uh, this, this is, this is Ghana. Ghana's hot. You want a cool drink? You gotta go to a cool country, you know what I mean? Knowing exactly what he meant, Ganesh pulled himself up out of the dirt and started to plod heavily northward. The rat raced to keep up with the retreating elephant. Hey, let me come with you. I'm dying for adventure. I'm bored out of my skull here. What do you say? The elephant gently laid the end of his trunk on the ground. What's your name? Ganesh asked as the rat scampered up his nose and onto his head. My name is Rat. Gee, it's great up here. What a view. Ganesh agreed. They began their journey to Russia. What the pair found there made them more than a little apprehensive. Apprehensive? Try petrified! But they agreed that the only way they were going to find a cold drink was to track down the person who lived here. They need your help. But whatever you do, do not Disturb the bones of the dead. Ah! Ah! Sure you really want to find her? Ah! Swept away. Swept. I want to be swept away. Be polite, which is like that. Woe ye who enter here! I can tap dance too! It's about time I got a little fresh meat for the cauldron. <laughs> You're nice and plump, too. <laughs> Ganesh tried with all his might to ignore this rude welcome. Bet you taste great in a black bean sauce. <laughs> but he could not. Ganesh grabbed the witch with his powerful trunk and was about to hurl her back toward Norway when Rat found his ear. Whoa, 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 whoa! Let's look at our long-term objective here, bud. And the Rat convinced Ganesh to set the witch down. Frightened by the threat of such massive physical force and fearing for her life, the witch decided to offer the strangers a bribe of sorts and handed them a large, ripe watermelon. Ah, just what we were looking for. The pair quickly strapped the melon to Ganesh's side and started off before Baba Yaga recovered from her stuporific state. Returning to India, they found the jungle court in complete disarray, for without the sun to wake them, the animals had fallen into a deep sleep. Except for Hanuman himself, whose pain had grown worse with time. Ganesh! Ganesh! Ouch! Ouch! Oh man, am I glad to see you! Is that my magic cooling fruit? Hanuman did not wait for a reply. He immediately pulled out a fistful of the fleshy fruit and devoured it. Uh, hey, listen, you want a napkin? The bright red juice ran down his chin and tickled his neck, and Hanuman began to laugh. It was the kind of laugh that does not subside quickly. Something must be really funny. Look. Ganesh pointed skyward, for Hanuman had laughed so hard, the sun had popped right out of his stomach. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, excuse me. Uh. 
sighed the Monkey King with a satisfaction he had never known before. And as the jungle animals awoke to Hanuman's heartfelt apology, the sun found her place in the sky once more and graced our world with light. Thank you for listening to my humble story. And where can we go now? Good choice, buddy. Mix and match is just coming up, champ. Hold tight. <laughs> We're in India today with a terrific mix and match for you to play. So jump off your elephant and let's go. Hit the go button. Go! See the word below me? It's Hindi. That's one of the main languages here in India. And it's a word for something in the picture. Can you drag the word to the thing it describes? Nariel. Nariel. Nari Nariel 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 Watch out above! These nuts could fall on your head! And we're off to a flyer! Chumgadar Who catches flies by sending out little sounds at night? Hati Hello, long nose! Only four left! Fool, sniff this. Ah, that's nice. Chipkali, a little reptile. Chipkali, a little reptile. Chipkali, a little reptile. Two left, nearly there. Tota, who's a pretty boy then? Ah! Bunder. <laughs> My number one helper. Well done, you. You got them all. One. Thanks to Chester for that Hindi word game fun. Where to go now? We're off to Ghana. <laughs> we are in Ghana. Help me introduce the Gigglebone gang to the locals. How good are you with creepy crawlies? Choose me to find out. So brave! Spiders, beware! We are coming through! Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then, when it's all ready, we'll begin. Long ago, in West Africa, there lived a clever but lazy spider named Anansi, who had two sons, strong legs and soft belly. One day, as Anansi stretched out in his hammock and settled in for a long nap, a falcon swooped down, grabbed Anansi with the sharp claws and carried him way up to the treetops. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Anansi yelled down to his two sons below. Hey, boys! Notice anything unusual about this picture? But his sons were not known for their razor-sharp intellect. Strong Legs picked up a stone and threw it at the falcon, hitting the bird right between the eyes. Off it flew in a startled state, leaving Anansi dangling from the very top of the tree. Nice job, Bozo! Now how am I supposed to get down? Uh, I know! I know! I know! cried Soft Belly. Working hard to please his father, he laid down next to the tree. Uh, a jump, Dad! Uh, you can land on my big fat belly! What are you, crazy? I'm too high up! Go find me a banana! I got an idea! The sons set out in search of a banana but soon returned empty-handed, for the banana season had ended in their part of the world. So, we got no bananas here. That means you gotta look elsewhere. Find somebody who can scout them out for you. Ah, uh, right, said Strong Legs, though he wondered why his father wanted a banana at all. Too afraid to ask him, the brothers went in search of a scout. But who in the garden 
can scout for bananas. The young spiders didn't know. Could you help them find somebody? I don't know how good I'll be, but I think I can scout for you. Flying in ever-widening circles, the butterfly searched for telltale signs of bananas. Just as she was about to give up, she found what she was looking for. <laughs> bananas! In Mexico! <laughs> Strong legs and soft belly boarded an abandoned coconut and set sail. <laughs> that way, pointed the butterfly. But alas, coconuts do not come with steering wheels, and the two floated aimlessly across great oceans before sinking off the coast of Japan. Any sign of a banana? asked Strong Legs. Soft belly pointed to a field of bright yellow plants growing on the ocean floor. The happy spider scaled the biggest plant he saw and tried to pull it out. Wait! I'm not sure if those are bananas! Before he could finish, the spider was sucked in by the yellow plant. Grabbing his brother's leg, strong legs held on tight. Uh, help! Uh, help! I can't! I, I can't hold on too much longer! Poor spiders! There must be somebody here who can help them. Do you know who it is? Uh, oh, excuse me. Ever eat a sea anemone? <laughs> Yuck! Black! Who does he think he's fooling? Forget it! I wouldn't go near those anemones if you paid me. Those silly anemones don't bother me. Check out my muscles. Here I come. The jellyfish, who worked out regularly, took a firm grasp of the spider's legs and began to tug with all her might. <coughs> Stretched to the breaking point, the voracious anemone finally let its victims go. And up, up. Up they went, shooting through the water and bursting into the sky. Whee! <laughs> Plummeting earthward, the jellyfish puffed out like a parachute. They touched down soft as you please on the tropical shores of Mexico. Strong legs and soft belly sat on the desert sand and pondered their next move. What do you want to do? I, I don't know. Uh, what do you want to do? Three hours later. They agreed they should look for bananas, and decided their best option was to look for an animal that eats bananas to point the way. Can you help them? You must choose wisely, and do not disturb the monkey. For while he is the obvious choice, he will be very angry if he catches the spiders trying to take his precious bananas. Want my bananas? Forget it! No way! Having caught the spiders trying to steal his bananas, the monkey flew into a terrible rage. In an instant, he had scooped up strong legs and soft belly and trapped them inside of a glass jar. It will take strong legs and soft belly quite a while to think themselves out of this situation. Meanwhile, back in Ghana, their father Anansi sits high in the tree, waiting for his sons to bring him a banana. Look out! There's a spider behind you! <laughs> Only joking! Where shall we play now, eh? I'd have picked me too, if I was you. Mix and match is just coming up, champ. Hold tight. <laughs> well, hello, scout. Now, we couldn't come all the way to Africa without tracking down some of my old animal cousins. And tracking is exactly what we need to do. How's about putting on your safari hat and helping your old pal Chester do some mix and match Africa style? Hit the go button. Go! Okay, big game hunters. See all the animals in the picture? One of them left a big old dirty footprint in the box below me. Let's drag the print to the animal that made it. Who's the owner? Who's the owner of this one? Who's the owner of this one?
Yes, the old hippopotamus made that print. Where does this weird one go? Where does this weird one go? Yes, the African rock python made that track. Here's a good one. Yes, the lion made that print. Who does this? Who does? Who does? Who does? Yes, the lizard made that print. Last three now. Where does? Yes, the crocodile. Where does? Yes, the old warthog made. Where does this? Yes, the chimp made that print. Whoa, talk about smooth sailing. Nice job. Still hot on the trail? Great. Now let's track down the others. I think they went that away. You helped that clever raccoon, didn't you? Where to next, my friend? Oh, don't be scared. I'm right behind you. <laughs> hey, <laughs> wait a sec. We'll be playing in no time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are in a traditional village in Ghana <laughs> with Kofi and little Kwashi. <laughs> and we're going to hear some talking drums. No, really, talking drums. <laughs> I'll give you all kinds of words. And you give them to Kofi, and he'll ask for them with his magic drum. Yep, honest. Hey, frog's honor. <laughs> Click on my belly to get started. Oh boy, I'm so excited. <laughs> Ahe she called Dondo. Ahe she called Dondo. Ahe in Tamo Dondo. Ahe. Ama for Dondo. Ahe. Agbae. Hi, I'm Kwashi. I live in this business. Fish. <laughs> oh, you knew that, didn't you? No? Oh. <laughs> Fish. Magic drum. Send me a fish. Ooh, wow. Fish. Oh, it's so pretty. In our village, we speak Ga. The word for this in Ga is Lo. Fish. Hello. A lion. Rawr. Let's give that word to Kofi. Lion. Magic drum. Send me a lion. Ooh, wow. A lion. Run. The word for this in Ga is Koche. Lion. Coco. <laughs> My favorite. <laughs> Coco pot. Magic drum. Send me a cocoa pot. Hey, give Kofi right. something and uh, watch the skies. Look out. The word. Agbae. Agbae. The word for this. This says bear. <laughs> Let's give that word to Kofi. Yeah. Bear. Magic drum. Send me a bear. Ooh. <laughs> the word for this in Ga is Oshishiblishi. Bear. Everybody do your hands up in the air. Cocoa pot. Magic drum. Send me a cocoa pot. Wanna ask for more toys? Ooh. You can. Yep. The word for this in Ga is cocoa. Cocoa pot. Oh, dog. Dog. Magic drum. Send me a dog. Ooh. The word for this in Ga is Wei. 
Dog. Hello. 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 Uh. Uh. Would you think the magic gem would give us some toys? The word for this G O A T Goat. Yup. Goat. Magic drum. Send me a goat. Ooh. The word for this in Ga is to goat. <laughs> the word for <laughs> The word for th <laughs> Oh, this says zebra. Zebra. Magic drum. Send me a zebra. All right. Zebra. <laughs> the word for this in Ga is Opongo. Zebra. The word for the I wonder how the talking drums would say peak another activity. <laughs> well, I'll be a chicken fried pig. You chose me. <coughs> Darling, you just sit tight while I get my things together for this. Hey, sugar, I have rounded up a whole herd of wild facts about fascinating Ghana. So rig up that fib detector and let's get ready to play. Vilma's fact or fib? Oh, it's hard to know where to start, huh? Well, pick any one of these six scintillating pictures. Oh, but don't forget, there's a fib or two hiding out there, so you be on the lookout. Holy Toledo, this big fella's an Ashanti king, and practically everything he's wearing is made of gold. Why, well, he's got solid gold necklaces, bracelets, earrings, and even a solid gold footstool. Hmm. Now what do you say, honey? Is that a fact or a fib? Oh. oh, well, we got you this time, Dumplin. It's no fib. The Ashanti people really do wear lots of gold. And that's because the ground in Ghana practically bubbles with the precious metal, which is why the area is known as the Gold Coast. Fact. At one time, instead of using dollars and cents to buy things, people just paid with the gold dust they panned in the rivers and with big old gold nuggets they found in rocks. Hey, do you like chocolate? Me too. I bet you didn't know that chocolate bars grow on trees in Ghana. Oh, sure they do. And when the chocolate bars are perfectly ripe, the workers pick them and ship them over to us in big boats. Now your call, Lamb Chop. Am I affecting or fibbing? <laughs> that fibbalizer's working just fine. You're absolutely right. Chocolate bars don't grow on trees, but chocolate beans do. You see, chocolate comes from the beans of the cacao plant. Every year in Ghana, they harvest big pods like this one off the plants, whack them open and collect the beans. 
which then have to ferment and be dried before they can be turned into delicious things like chocolate bars. Woo, I love them. Click on any one, and now she's playing the talking drums. Ghanaians have been using the talking drums to communicate for hundreds of years. Now the way it works is, she bangs on the drum, and then the drum, which has this little old mouth, it starts shouting out the message real loud like this, so all the villagers can hear. Now you pick your poison cupcake. Is that a fact or fib? Oh, you caught me. Oh, nice work. <laughs> of course, drums don't actually talk, but the Ashanti have figured out a way to get a message across anyway. You see, they use two drums. One is pitched high like this, and the other is pitched low like this. Now, by alternating between these high and low sounds, the Ashanti drums can beat out just about any message you want. Pick a fact, and we funerals aren't such a sad time in Ghana. They're singing and drumming and dancing to celebrate the end of one life and the beginning of another. But did you know that when a fisherman dies in Ghana, they bury him in the biggest fish they can catch? Now, what do you think? Am I affecting you or fibbing you? Boy, I can't fool you. Nice work. Of course, fishermen aren't buried inside a real fish. But they can be buried in a pretend fish that's carved out of wood. Now, it's called a fantasy casket, and it's one way you can get your last wish in life. Some Ghanaians ask for a giant fish casket. Others ask for giant cacao pod caskets. Some even ask for fancy car caskets. Pick a fact, and people in Ghana make their homes in all kinds of places. Some have houses, some have huts, and others live in apartments. But did you know that in Ghana, there's a tree you can actually live inside of? Now, does that sound like a fact or fib? Oh, you are 100% correct. There is a tree in Ghana that people can live inside of, and it's called the baobab tree. Its trunk can grow to be 30 feet thick. Now, that's about the size of your average living room. You just dig out the insides and set up shop. Easy as pie. Click on it. In Ghana, if a woman wants to have a baby or, or if she's pregnant and wants to make sure that her baby's going to be nice and healthy, you know what she does? She starts carrying around a doll, just like this one, to make sure that all goes well. Your pick, sweetie. Is that a fact or a fib? Oh, you're darn tootin' it's true. Nice work, honey. These special dolls are called Akua Ba and are made out of wood. Now, Ghanaian women will carry them around and care for them just as if they were a real child. Probably helps them think positive thoughts for the little one that they're hoping for, huh? Oh, yeah. Click on any picture and all. Oh, those fibs had you sweating and sweltering under the African sun. So let's cool off and grab the others. Hey, 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 wait for me, though. Velma, brains and beauty. She's one fine swine. But where to go now? You'll like this stuff, I promise. <coughs> Hang on, please. We're just getting ready. Hmm? You're not going to believe the animals I caught in Ghana with my handy-dandy camera. Children in the village all love animals. They travel from their village to the nature preserve. It's a place where the animals are safe from harm, where they can run and splash and gallop and gur. Let's go see the animals, crocodile and buffalo. See the animals, elephant and warthog. See the animals, hippopotamus and antelope. See the animals, giraffe and hyena. From the biggest lion to the littlest bird, we take care of the animals. Hey, let's see what I'm else is going I'm a big animal on. fan myself, being a big animal. <laughs> Where to next, my friend? Egypt! We're on our way! <laughs> Egypt, land of the pharaohs. And boy, are you in for a few surprises here. Now, darling, if you pick me, I will fact you up and I'll fib you down. You chose Rapu. 
Good choice. Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then, when it's all ready, we'll begin. Long ago, in the ancient Egyptian city of Crocodilopolis, there lived a crocodile king named Sebek, who ruled the land with his beautiful and fertile queen, Neith. One day, the king announced, <coughs> Um, good folk, Queen Neith and I are with egg. Well, more accurately, with eggs. The king pointed proudly to the royal nest piled high with crocodile eggs. His loyal subjects were jubilantly happy. Party! 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 All of Crocodilopolis proceeded to dance and sing, all except for the evil cobra, Buto. My, those look awfully good, <laughs> said Buto, as he slithered into the palace tent and quickly swallowed one of the precious eggs whole. When the queen returned to the palace, she immediately set to counting her royal offspring. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. Oh! Oh! My baby is gone! wailed the queen with enormous force. Her tears threatened to drown the city. Just then, the palace gong gonged. No! Who could that be? Standing outside the royal tent was a young hippopotamus named Torette. I am here to help, your highness. Having recognized a golden opportunity, Torette swore by the goddess Isis she would find a way to return the egg unharmed. For this, the king promised to reward her handsomely. But if you fail to find our egg, you shall be banished from Egypt. How am I going to get an egg from a snake's belly? Quickly, she went to find Egret, the wise bird that lived along the Nile. Being very wise indeed, Ygrette had hid herself from Taurette's view, for though her advice was free, she wasn't in the habit of giving it away to fortune-seeking hippopotami. Ygrette! Oh, Ygrette! Hmm, I know she's here somewhere. Can you help Taurette find the wise bird? Just click on the places she might be hiding. Wow! Now that you've found me, I suppose I should help out. Oh, Egret, am I glad to see you. Find the tree with the foul-tasting leaves, said Egret, with a convincing air of authority. The eucalyptus tree, you must mash up its leaves and disguise them in a sweet for Buto to eat. Then he will spit up the royal egg whole. But... Where do I find this eucalyptus tree? Lend me your foot, said the egret, who proceeded to boost Torette up upon a camel's back. Travel west until you reach Ghana. Then give this lotus flower to my friend Anansi. He will tell you where the eucalyptus tree lives. So step by step. Oh, 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 hey! Torette crossed the vast Sahara Desert to the African nation of Ghana. Whoa! We made it! Now, all I have to do is find Anansi! <laughs> but what exactly is an Anansi? Do you know? Taurette could use your help to find this mysterious creature. Mm, Anansi likes trees, but don't spread it around. Nancy has eight legs, you know. <laughs> Who? What? Where? Oh, whoa, what are you? No, 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 let, let me guess. Uh... Well, please, Mr. Anansi, my friend Egret said I should... Whoa, whoa, hey, hey! Egret of, uh, of Egypt? Now, Anansi was all ears. For many years before, he and Egret had been deeply in love.
Tauret handed Anansi the lotus flower, and the poor spider was overcome with feelings of longing and loss. Oh, man, do I miss her. But the spider soon snapped back from the depths of melancholy. Eucalyptus tree, eucalyptus tree. Mm, doesn't ring an African bell, but I know they got him in Australia. Anansi referred the hippo to a friend who lived in Australia. You need to talk to my old friend Kip. He's a koala bear and can be kind of shy. You better take him a little gift. Anansi pulled out a coconut and handed it to Tourette. It's mighty hot in Australia, and coconut milk is cool and ooh, so sweet. Coconut? Australia? Mm, gee, isn't there a very large body of water between here and there? How am I supposed to- Easy as pie. Watch this. With his legs flying, Anansi began to spin a long, thin rope. On and on he worked, as the sun set serenely over the Atlantic. By midnight, the spider was finished. Here, here, hold this. Anansi handed the hippo one end of the rope. He fashioned a noose at the other and began to whip it around in wild circles above his head. Look, maybe... Here you go now, hang on tight! The spider tossed his rope up, up, up until it wrapped itself around the moon, sending the hysterical hippo swinging through the air across the seas. As luck would have it, Tarret's grip gave out just as the rope passed over Australia, dropping her, neat as you please, right on the coast. Oh, oof! Bone weary, Tarret dusted off her wrinkled hide and began to search for Kip, the koala bear. But she had no idea what a koala bear was or where to find one. She will need your help, but I must warn you, watch out for the cockatoo bird. He will lead you astray. That one is always telling lies. Hmm, where would a koala bear be? Of all the uncourteous- Look, I was asleep! Hup, to check the trees! Hup, to check the trees! You were looking for me? <laughs> Fancy that. Torette poured her heart out to the young koala. So, you see, Ygrette suggested that perhaps you would be willing to give me some of those foul-tasting leaves so I could mash them up in a sweet for Buto. What, uh, do you think? The small bear thought for a moment. I don't suppose you, uh, have any water on you? I'm rather thirsty. Water? Well, no, I, uh... Oh! Oh! Torette remembered the coconut Anansi had given her. Oh, I have something ten times better. A coconut. There's milk inside it. There is? Yes! Cracking it once, with some force against her own thick skull, Torette halved the coconut neatly in two. Mm, this is good. <sighs> You've got a deal. With that simple affirmation, Kip deftly climbed the eucalyptus tree and tore off a large handful of leaves for Tourette. Gee, thank you! Tiptoeing up to her leathery face, the koala bear kissed Tourette sweetly on the forehead. <coughs> Goodbye. Oh, 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 oh boy! <laughs> As luck would have it, this was Tarette's first kiss, and swift as an eagle, she soared back to Egypt on the wings of love. Wow! Wow! She arrived just in time. Hurry up! His digestive juices are flowing! Quick as she could, Ygrette mixed up a batch of the pale green candies. Gee, they don't look so good. To a snake? They look great. Now go! Tourette approached Buto in her most diplomatic manner. Oh, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Snake? Stand back. I've begun digesting. In her own halting style, Tourette proceeded to convince the cobra that her candies would not only aid digestion, but also prevent a nasty case of heartburn later. One over, Buto snapped up the entire tray. Mm, 
They are sweet. <laughs> but, but, uh, what's that? What's that awful? In a display of dyspepsia too grotesque to describe, Buto spit up the royal egg, which Torette carried swiftly out of danger and back to the palace. My baby! My baby! <laughs> My baby is back! The king declared a feast that evening in honor of Torette. Once again, his loyal subjects were jubilantly happy. Party! 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 At the banquet, the king and queen asked Torette if she would like to live in the royal palace and bask in untold comforts for the rest of her days, to which the hippo replied a hasty, <laughs> Sure! And so she did, which, dear friends, thanks to you, brings our story to a close. Every word of that is true. Crocodile's honor. But what shall we get to next? We're off. Great. Hang on, please. We're just getting ready. Hmm? The desert. The pyramids. Doesn't it make you want to sing? We'll sail up the river now. Past palm trees and green fields. Watches over his desert land Statues and pictures tell a tale of an Egypt old and grand And the pyramids are big beyond all imaginings Golden treasures we will see In the land of the ancient kings Enough photos for now? Okay! <laughs> I'll be humming that one for a while. Let's try something new. Well, I'll be a chicken fried pig. You chose me. <coughs> Darling, you just sit tight while I get my things together for this. Don't mind the dust, boys and girls, because when it clears, we'll be nosing our way through some of the greatest triumphs of human history. The tombs and pyramids of ancient Egypt. So warm up your fit finder and let's play. Velma's Fact or Fib. Pick a fact, pumpkin, and we'll get going. But remember, some of these facts are just fibs in disguise. So stay on your toes. Now you ready? Okay, let's see what's what. Charming looking gentleman, isn't he? Hey, did you know that when Egyptians mummified a dead person, the first thing they did was take out their organs and preserve them in special jars? They even pulled the poor guy's brain out through his nose with a wire hook. Now you tell me, is that a fact or a fib? Oh my goodness, you know your mummies. That is absolutely correct. Now, after they took the organs out, they covered the body in salt to dry it out, rubbed it all over with sweet-smelling oils, and then wrapped it in layers and layers of linen strips to preserve them forever. Go on and pick a fact. You want to know why the Egyptians spent up to 20 years building each and every pyramid? Well, I'll tell you. They built them as giant tombstones for their dead kings. One little king was tucked under each of them big old pyramids. Now what do you think? Does that sound like a fact? Or just a nice juicy fib? Right. Well that thinking cap of yours works just like a charm. You are right. The Egyptians did build pyramids for their kings to make sure they wouldn't be forgotten on down the road. Now I'd say that that worked pretty well. Come on now, pick a fact, Pumpkin. This handsome fella is King Tutankhamun. <laughs> King Tut, for short. He became Pharaoh of Egypt when he was only nine years old. And when he died, at the ripe old age of 18, he was buried in a tomb with all his riches in a coffin made of solid gold. Now, is this a fact or a fib? Good gracious, honey, that's right. Why, you are turning into one fine Egyptologist. King Tutankhamun was actually buried in three coffins, each fitting snugly into the next. The outer two were carved in wood and painted with gold leaf, 
but the heavy inner one was indeed solid gold. Click on any one, and Egyptian kings were buried with tons of stuff they thought they could use in the afterlife, like gold and jewels, even a throne or two, <laughs> which made their tombs popular targets for robbers who stole the riches and often destroyed the mummies in the process. Now what do you think? Is that an actual fact, or is it a big old fib? Oh my goodness, nothing gets past you. You are right. In fact, there were so many robberies that the poor old priests who guarded the mummies, they were often forced to move them from tomb to tomb in the middle of the night just so they wouldn't be destroyed. Click on any picture and off we go. This is a monument to Egypt's most famous extinct animal, the Sphinx. Oh, it was a ferocious creature with a lion body and a human head. And he terrified Egypt over 5,000 years ago. Now, what do you think, darling? Is that a fact or just a stretch of the imagination? <laughs> oh, I didn't fool you one bit, did I? Nice job. You see, the Sphinx never really existed. Oh, no. But that didn't stop the Egyptians from building giant monuments like this one. In fact, Egyptian pharaohs thought it made them seem more powerful to have their faces carved on top of these lion bodies. Click on any one and we'll get moving. Back when the pyramids were built, there was no construction equipment like we've got today. Oh no, every one of those 15 ton stones, now that's as heavy as your house, honey. Well, they were placed on top of each other by the Egyptians using brute strength and brain power. Sound like a fact or a fib? I know you tell me. <laughs> you are right as rain, sugar. Thousands of slaves put those big old stones on giant sleds with log rollers under them. And then they tugged them inch by inch up long sand ramps to their places on the pyramid. Well, I know I'd be dog tired after a day like that. Pick a fact and we'll get going. Oh, sweet mercy. Why, well, those facts and fibs have been itching in my brain like sand in my sandals. So what do you say let's go shimmy over and find the others? What can I say about Velma's facts? Marvelous! Where shall we jaunt to now? Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Hey, uh, wait a sec. We'll be playing in no time. Mm -hmm. Oh boy! Hey, here we are in Egypt, where it is really, really hot and dry. So, uh, people, plants, and animals all need to use the Nile River in order to, uh, um, thrive. Yeah. <laughs> Click on my belly and I'll give you seeds to plant, then uh, water them with water from the Nile to grow food for people and animals. But hey, hey, oh, 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 oh. watch out for crocodiles and other wild creatures. Yep. Oh, you gotta look out. Yep. Uh, this is for irrigating the fields. Uh, irrigate. That is like the word for watering, you know. Yeah, yeah. You need to give the seeds plenty to drink. <laughs> Oh, those plants were thirsty. Ahmed the farmer. Want to make Ahmed climb a tree? Yeah. These will turn into limes if you grow them well. Oh, yeah, honest, yep. Oh, these will need plenty of water. Use the wheel or jug to water them. Hey, 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 no! Who can swim? Hey, hey! Hey, you can pick the stuff! Sure you can! Or, uh, Ahmed can? Yeah, go on, try. Hey, it's Ahmed's camel! <laughs> Just ready for you to load him up with stuff. Hey, neat! <laughs> I bet your animals like to eat that.
A kingfisher? <laughs> He's looking for fish, you know. Yep. Uh, that is a dung beetle. <laughs> yeah, he likes, uh, dirt. <laughs> That's what we call it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's made a dung ball. <laughs> that is nature's uh, fertilizer. <laughs> uh, food for plants. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not one. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, these seeds grow into sugar cane. Yeah, <laughs> like a candy tree. <laughs> Oh, now that needs water for growing. Uh -huh. Just like... Hey, hey, no! Hey, you can pick the stuff! Sure you can! Hey, neat! <laughs> I bet you animals like to eat that. That's a Faluka. <laughs> That's Ahmed's boat. Oh, African hare. <laughs> oh, he looks hungry. Skink. That's like a lizard, you know. Oh, oranges. Oh, they're so good. Want to plant and water them? Hey, how are your plants doing? Are they thirsty? Oh. <laughs> hey, you can pick the stuff. Sure you can. Hey, neat. <laughs> I bet you animals like to eat that. Oh, <laughs> oh, we can use that for watering. Hey. Hey, seeds to grow bananas. Ooh, let's plant them. Hey, how are your plants doing? Oh, wow. Hey. <laughs> hey, you can pick the stuff. Sure you can. Hey, neat! <laughs> I bet you animals like to eat that. Hey, neat! <laughs> I bet you animals... See you later, alligator. On the Nile, crocodile. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> that Ahmed is quite a character, isn't he? <laughs> but what else would you like to do while we're here? I'd have picked me too, if I was you. Mix and match is just coming up, champ. Hold tight. <laughs> Howdy, scout. We've mysteriously gone back in time to try to help out these Egyptian builders finish this lady's house. They need you to help them find some things in the picture. Want to give it a shot? Just press go, and we're ready to start. Go! Okay, sport. There's something to help complete the construction in the box below me. Drag it to where you can see it in the picture. See that below me? Just a liar. An ancient harp thingamabob. And we're off to a flyer. This is a hieroglyph, sport. It says foot. Good matching, scout. This Egyptian writing says owl. A painting of a boat.
A painting of trees. A painting of tree. A painting of trees. The kids duck. Only one left. Great work. A jug. Wowzers, you did it. Full house. More? Yes, please, Skipper. If you click on the kid down below, we'll go find the harder bits and pieces. And remind me to bring us back to ancient Egypt sometime. Now, what say we find the gang? I wonder if they'll ever finish that building. And now, what's next? You choose. We're off to China! <laughs> China, home to one billion people. That's a lot. And now there's a billion and six. You, me, and the Gigglebone gang. Wanna meet a fire-breathing dragon? <laughs> Choose me! Aw, oh, don't be scared. I'm right behind ya! <laughs> Hey, uh, wait a sec. We'll be playing in no time. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey there. We are in China, celebrating the new year with a magic fireworks dragon. <laughs> now, in China, every year is named after an animal. Oh, yes, honest. Yep. <laughs> Click on my belly for some animals, and I'll tell you about their Chinese uh, personalities. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, you can paint them in the colored pools and give them to the magic dragon to make your own fireworks display. The dragon has a year too. He is healthy and passionate. Hey, let's feed the magic dragon some animals to make a fireworks display. Nifty snake! The snake is wise and intense. Hey, hey, hey! Hey, we need to make fire for some fireworks, yeah. Can you fetch some? Go, okay. Hurry. Whoa! That fire is dragon food for making fireworks! Can you- Whoa! <laughs> Roosters are pioneers and hard workers too. Yeah, <laughs> work a doodle doo. <laughs> Oh, look at that. The bright and patient ox. Oh. The rabbit is lucky and, uh, uh affectionate. Yeah. Wanna make a horse and tiger fireworks? Go on. Yeah, try. The horse is handsome <laughs> and popular. <laughs> they always are, you know. <laughs> oh, hey, it's like a monkey Sue. <laughs> hey there. Yeah, monkeys are very clever. Very clever. <laughs> hey, we need some fire to make fireworks. Yeah. You want to get some? Okay. Oh, I can't play on an empty stomach. Oh, please feed me. Oh, time to go so soon. Ha, okay, let's go. Come on. What a display you made with Bungie. I myself was born. In the year of the tiger. <laughs> How shall we follow that? Please choose someone. Oh, I thought you'd never ask. <coughs> Darling, you just sit tight while I get my things together for this. China has been flourishing as a culture longer than any other civilization on Earth. 
Maybe that explains the amazing things I've uncovered there. So grab that fib detector doll, cause we're about to take the fast boat to China and play Velma's Fact or Fib. Now remember, Pumpkin, there's a fib or two hiding in here that just don't square with the facts. You game? All right then, pick a fact and we'll get going. Woo-wee! Those needles are a part of an ancient form of Chinese medicine called acupuncture. Although it looks painful, acupuncture is often used by doctors to relieve pain in their patients. Sound like a fact or a big old fib? Well, that is what I call expert decision-making. You're right. The Chinese really do use special needles to make people feel better. Fact, acupuncture works so well, some doctors are able to perform minor surgery on people who are wide awake without the patient feeling any pain. What can you imagine? Come on now, pick a fact, pumpkin. And oh, look at that. That is a panda bear. Ain't he just the sweetest thing? You know, panda bears live in China. Fact, China today is overflowing with pandas. Hundreds, thousands of them roaming all over the southern part of the country. Your call now. Fact or fib? Well, I wish I wasn't fibbing on this one, but you are absolutely right. It used to be that pandas thrived in southern China, but many of them starved to death when a special type of bamboo that they fed on died away. And now there's only about 1,000 left. Click on any picture and we'll get this show. Now, I bet you've all seen this before. It's called the Great Wall of China. And we're not talking your ordinary wall, oh no. Why, the Great Wall is so long that it would take you almost two months if you walked day and night to go from one end to the other. What do you say? Is that a fact or a fib? Oh my, my, you hit that nail right on the head. Good job. Fact is, the Great Wall stretches over 4,000 miles and was built by slaves and soldiers to protect China from those pesky barbarian invaders. Pick Now ain't that about the prettiest piece of cloth you ever saw? It's made from a caterpillar's cocoon. Yes, sir. The Chinese unwind those cocoons and weave the thread into beautiful silks. Now, does that sound like a fib or is that a fact? Verily, I say it is a fact. Excellent work, sugar. The caterpillars the Chinese use are called silk worms. Their cocoons are made from silk thread they produce inside their bodies. Now, Chinese farmers gather up those cocoons, unwind them, and dye them all sorts of gorgeous colors to make that silk cloth. Click on any. Did you know that the first emperor of China had 6,000 soldiers buried alive in his tomb to protect him? Woo! What's your verdict on that one? Fact or fib? Oh. Whoops, oh dear, this one really is a fish story. When archaeologists uncovered the first emperor's tomb, oh, they did find 6,000 soldiers buried with him, but they weren't real men. No, they were life-size statues made of clay. Why, he even had clay horses made to pull his chariots once his afterlife got rolling. <laughs> Click on any picture. This is Prince Liu Sheng. He died over 2,000 years ago. But you know, this prince was such a prideful guy that he had his tailors whip him up a suit of pure jade tied together with gold thread just so he could impress people at all those raw functions. Sound like fact? Or is Velma just dishing you up a big old juicy fib? Oh, oh sorry, darling. The prince did have a jade suit made, but it wasn't for royal functions. Oh, no, he was buried in it. You see, Prince Liu was hoping that the jade would preserve his body forever. Unfortunately, when his tomb was opened thousands of years later, the prince was long gone. But his suit, made of 2,498 pieces of jade, well, it was looking just mighty fine. Click on any picture and we'll get this show on the road.
Oh, those facts and fibs had you picking and clicking like a pair of old chopsticks. But how about finding out what trouble the others have gotten into? Once again, I am dumbstruck by your wisdom, Velma. But now what shall we do? Oh, nice picking. Nice picking indeed. Mix and match is just coming up, champ. Hold tight. <laughs> ho dee ho Scout. Today, the Chinese mix and match is the ancient game of tangrams. These traditional picture games are made from seven little shapes. You put them together and just see. I'll turn them into something cool. Just press go and we're ready to start. Go! Okay, there's the first shape in this box, and you drag it to where it fits into the big one in the picture. What a triangle! What a... There's the... Teeny triangle! Middling... What a seal! Congratulations! Wanna tangle with the tangrams some more? Great! If you click on the kid, you can try- This'll be pretty- Go! Teeny triangle! A big triangle! What a triangle! Teeny triangle. Small triangle. Small triangle. There's the square. A big triangle. What a tri- A fox. No worries. That's all of them. Whew. Let's find the others. What a tangle of tantalizing tangrams from Chester. Now what? You'll like this stuff, I promise. <coughs> Hang on, please. We're just getting ready. Hmm? Let's do some Chinese Tai Chi. Don't know how? I can show you. In the morning, children like to play. Then get ready to start their busy day. They walk to school. Traffic rushes, there they practice writing with their brushes. They do Tai Chi like the grown ups do, and learn music and dances old and new. School is fun, I'm sure you will agree, but it's nice to go home to your family. How about finding Rapu and the Wonderful others? Wonderful Chinese children! But whatever shall we do now? <laughs> oh, what an honor! Story on its way! Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then, when it's all ready, we'll begin! Long ago, in ancient China, there lived a young panda bear with a very big problem. She was passionate about fruit. So passionate that when she saw a peach or persimmon hanging from a tree, she set her mind to eating it and would not rest until she had. And in this same orchard lived a unicorn who worried about the bear and her gluttonous habits, especially during the harvest, when the panda, whose name was Su Lin, gorged herself for days. Little one, you must stop this. But she did not, and her habits were about to get her into serious trouble, for the emperor had been told of the panda who was eating all his fruit and sent his army to find her. Su Lin, listen to me. The emperor's army is coming. You must hide yourself. His army? Hmm. Oh, I must hide. But where? I have grown too big for my usual spots. And indeed it was true. Su Lin had grown so enormous that it was impossible to conceal her enormous backside. Oh, unicorn, whatever will happen to me? 
The unicorn did not know, but he feared the worst, and went to talk to the emperor's commander. Now Su Lin is all alone and frightened. She could use your help. Have you some thoughts on where she might hide? Su Lin! Su Lin! Su Lin! Come on, hide behind our bush. Su Lin hid behind the mulberry bush, just as the commander entered the garden. Su Lin! Show yourself! His Royal Excellency, the Emperor, commands it! Poor Su Lin shook so hard with fright that all the leaves fell off the bush, revealing her through a net of bare branches. Oh, what's to become of me? wailed Su Lin. You are to be banished from China! And with that, Su Lin was wrapped in chains and transported to the port city of Shanghai, where she was thrown onto a Portuguese sailing ship bound for Macau. Are there fruits in Macau? she asked, for though her plight was desperate, her mind was still on her stomach. Alas, Su Lin would never see Macau, for just as the ship left harbor, it was beset by a raging storm that sunk the wooden vessel deep off the coast of Japan. As Su Lin sat holding her breath on the ocean floor, she wondered who could transport her out of this watery predicament. Do you have any insights? Is there someone in these seas who can help our friend? This way, that way, this way, that way, this way, that way, this way, that way, this way, that way. <laughs> Gee, I'm a seahorse. You must be a sea panda. <laughs> Get it? Sea panda. <laughs> yeah, come to me, baby. Come on to me, baby. Yeah, come on. Su Lin turned just in time to see the great white shark barreling towards her. Wait! No! I... Ah! But sharks have a tendency to eat first and ask questions later, and so it was with this one, who heard very little of the panda's protest. Su Lin was thrown into utter darkness, and the shark's gastric juices swirled around her in slippery whirlpools. Oh, yuck! Slime! Fortunately, the digestive system of a great white shark works very slowly. Weeks went by, and the shark swam and swam, distended and in pain along the ocean floor, waiting for his peptic acids to kick in. Blech. Oh, excuse me. Su Lin grew bored and took this opportunity to begin a rigorous regimen of aerobics. This added significantly to the shark's discomfort. One and two and three and work it, and work it, and work it, and one and two and work it. After many weeks, the shark gave up on this panda dinner and spit Su Lin out into the shores of the Nile River in Egypt. <coughs> Su Lin, interrupted a voice the bear had almost forgotten. Su Lin, you have not forgotten your home, have you? Oh, no, unicorn. But which way is China from here? You must ask the lowest of the low. The lowest of the low? What do you mean by that? But the unicorn had left her consciousness, and Su Lin was once more on her own. The lowest of the low. Can you help Su Lin find the lowest of the low? Whatever you do, do not disturb the mummy case. We're pretty little, but it's not us. It is lower still. <laughs> Look, I might be low, but I'm not the lowest. I ask you to look elsewhere. I am royalty, you know. One, two, oh, don't bother me, I'm counting. Three, four. <laughs> How dare you even consider me? Take heart! All Earth's creatures are low to me! We're pretty little, but it's not us. It is lower still.
kill. <laughs> yep, you guessed it. That's what they call me, the lowest of the low. <laughs> Just because I work with dung. But listen, hey, I'm the guy that can get you to China. You can? Inquired Su Lin, a bit skeptical. The scarab beetle eyed the panda and decided to overlook Su Lin's lack of faith in him. <laughs> Follow me, but watch out, because I'm about to roll the world's biggest ball of dung right across Asia and straight into your hometown. <laughs> then we'll see who calls who the lowest of the low. And that is exactly what the feisty beetle did. With Su Lin in tow, he blazed a trail through Iraq and across the mountains of Afghanistan. He arrived in Tibet with a dung ball that measured over 12 feet in diameter. But trouble awaited the unlikely pair. On the eastern slopes of the Himalayas, the dung ball got away from the beetle and began to roll faster and faster downhill. Hey, 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 wait for me! <laughs> cried the beetle, leaping onto the renegade dung ball as it headed rapidly toward Chengdu. So long, sister! <laughs> Su Lin watched the dung ball roll out of sight. She had come so far, but still was not home yet. Su Lin contemplated her choices, but she did not know which road to take. If only you were here, unicorn, she asked to the air around her. A voice answered back, You are almost home, Su Lin. Su Lin rushed to climb the steep deep rocky path before her. At the summit she looked down to a valley lush with bamboo forests, and there, grazing serenely by a gentle stream, stood the unicorn. Welcome, Sulin. It is good that you are finally home. And so it was, for on her remarkable journey, Sulin had lost all cravings for cultivated fruits. Now she found the simple, crisp taste of the bamboo that grew in abundance around her to be much more to her liking. And to this very day, the pandas of China still live in the misty forests of the Sichuan Mountains and munch happily on bamboo all day long. Thank you, panda lovers, for whiling away the moments with me. Would you care to visit with someone else? Australia? Here we come! <laughs> sheep, diamonds, coral, sheep, koalas, and more sheep! <laughs> Australia, the beautiful! I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Oh, choose me, honey, please. Hold on to your hats, we're off and away! Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then, when it's all ready, we'll begin! <laughs> Once long ago, in the dusty outback of Australia, there lived a band of bunyips who ate unsuspecting human beings that had fallen for their silly tricks. The leader of this horde was a mischievous bunyip named Yeri, who grew tired of eating thin, stringy people. Listen up, dunderheads! It's time for a change! Let's go raid the ghost gum trees! Yeah! Off shot the bunyips to a grove of trees where the little stingless bush bees had a hive full of honey. Gorging themselves, the bunyips emptied the hive, and with blotched and sticky faces, they turned toward their watering hole, which they referred to as a billabong. Ah! Yeri! There's no water here! How are we gonna wash up? Yeah, you blockhead! Noodle face! You stupid yip! Shut up! barked Yeri as she racked her brain for a way out of this mess. Then she heard a strange noise. There, across the billabong, slept the rain spirit. He could fill it up in no time. Yeri raced over to the sleeping ancestral spirit and shook him. Hey! You big bag of wind, wake up! But nothing roused the spirit, and the impetuous bunyip soon resorted to drastic measures. Grabbing a deadly tiger snake by its tail, she threw it at the rain spirit. <sniffs> Landing in his ample lap, the snake bit the rain spirit on his ghost-like tummy. 
Oh! cried the spirit, waking up in pain and surprise. The flesh around the bite turned blue, and the rain spirit writhed in agony. The bunyips turned on Yeti. You dipstick! Look what you've done! You better find an antidote, quick! Yeti searched high and low, but alas, she couldn't concentrate. Antidote! Antidote! What's an antidote look like, anyway? Someone here by the billabong can help Yeti find an antidote. Do you know who it is? Wait now. There's no antidote here. Just move along. Not me. I saw what she did to my cousin. Did you see that? Yes, I did. Can you imagine? No, I can't. She heard the spirit! That's a big no-no! Hop two! Who are you? I've been helpful before, haven't I? Sometimes you must dig deep for answers. Bring it. You got an idea. What? Who said that? The voice of a tunnel web spider is quite soft. It was a moment before Yeri realized the spider was clinging to her forehead. You're not gonna find an antidote in Australia. The only place they got that stuff is in India. India? But that's across the ocean! So, come on. The little spider scurried over to his tunnel. I've been to India lots of times. Hey, follow me. And with that, the spider disappeared down the hole, followed by Yeri, whose personal motto, like all bunyips, was, Leap before you look! But the buoyant bunyip soon regretted her haste, for spider tunnels are dark and deep and filled with the most ghostly noises. What? What's that sound? Ah, the, uh, the ancestral beings. They live down here, you know, waiting to rise again. Just be nice to them. They'll be nice to you. The basic rule of thumb worked for the spider, but the bunyip was another matter, for she had harmed the rain spirit, and his underground brothers were angry. Yeri! Yeri! Look out! The spider cried as a snarling wombat spirit chased them up one tiny corridor and down another. Finally, Yeri spotted daylight. This way! Come on! As they scrambled out of the hole, the wombat's paw caught one of the spider legs. Ah, oh, help! The spider cried as the wombat spirit dragged him down the hole and back under the earth. Spider? <laughs> spider! <laughs> My one true friend! Tasting grief for the very first time, the bunyip soon fell into a depressed stupor. What am I doing? Where am I? The bunyip looked dully around, wondering where she had emerged. Do you know where Yeri is now? Can you help her find out? My swimming companions are whiz at geography. Don't have a clue, I'm just passing through. We're definitely north of Bolivia! Where are we? Yeah, it starts with an M. That's all I'll say. My, my, my. Must we ask so many questions? Hi! Hello there. I have no idea what you mean. <laughs> we are in North America. Are we not? We most certainly are. <laughs> Mexico, I believe. You got us where we are. Yes, yes. Mooed the manatee gently as she swam toward shore to get a closer look at the dirty faced bunyip. Is that a beard you're wearing? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever makes you look so sad? Don't laugh! 
I just lost my best friend. Oh, <laughs> let's see a happy face. <laughs> happy face. <laughs> now, the manatee had irked the bunyip, which is not recommended. Yeti picked up a long vine that lay at her feet and, smiling like a maniac, walked out into the waves. You want to see my happy face? Here it is! Lashing out, the bunyip lassoed the sea cow and hopped onto her back. Yee-haw! Ride em, cowgirl! The poor cow tried to throw Yeri off, but to no avail, and off they rode, bucking and screaming towards India. Let's see who gets the last laugh now, you big old cow! But the manatee had her revenge, for as soon as the bunyip was asleep, she slipped the rope from her neck and with extreme force flung Yeri out of the water and well into India. <laughs> and good riddance. <laughs> ah! Again, Yeri found herself a stranger in a strange land. This one, even stranger than the last. If I ever make it out of this overgrown terrarium, I am never leaving the billabong again! She proclaimed, smashing her way through the foliage and into the Monkey King's jungle court where his majesty awaited her. A visitor! Let's boogie! Grabbing Yeti, the Monkey King swung her this way and that. Yeah, you have a, you have a, an antidote? A what? Antidote for a snake bite, huh? <laughs> snake bite? Oh, well for that you've got to go right to the source. See ya! And before you can say step ball change, the Monkey King was back on the throne, assiduously ignoring his bewildered guest. Yeti pondered the last words of her host. I must go right to the source? Hmm. Do you know what the Monkey King meant? Our sticky bunyip could use your help, but look out for the big mean rhino. Oh dear, poor little thing. She's got to go to the source. Oh, no, 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 no. Not here, not here. Don't be scared! You must face your demons! Well, well, well. I see you decided to come right to the source, hmm? Uh, yes? Piped the bunyip as the cobra encircled himself around her middle and squeezed. You see that rain spirit's been <clears throat> bit and we must hurry! <clears throat> really? Well then, lay this on the wound, and it will suck the venom out. Yeri grabbed the paste and raced through the jungle, tripping on some undergrowth and landing face first in the dirt. But there, right in front of her nose, was a hole in the ground. She eyed her best travel option with suspicion. Anything could be down that stinking hole! Anything is! She took a wild leap and dove into the ground, crawling on hands and knees through a maze of tunnels. She dared not look behind her. But it wasn't what was behind her that should have worried the bunyip. Turning a corner, she stopped suddenly. In front of her lay an angry wall of ancestors. There you are. We've been expecting you. Please! <laughs> Please! I'll never... I promise! And miraculously, they all disappeared. Yeri turned round to find out why. There stood the most imposing spirit of her old friend, the spider. Quick, they'll be back soon. Up that way in your home. Spider, how can I... Go, just go! And the bunyip skirted up the last few meters of topsoil, popping her head up beside the billabong. Yeri ran straight to the ailing spirit and spread the thick paste on his wound. While the antidote worked its magic, she turned her attention to her band of followers as they stood with their faces glued together. What happened to you guys? She asked, learning that while she was gone, the bunyips had grown impatient and decided to lick the messes off each other's faces. But without water, the honey glued each tongue wherever it landed. I've been awful! Really, really, really awful! moaned the bunyips. And at that very moment, it started to rain. And every bunyip's tongue loosened and soon found its way back to a grateful bunyip mouth. And they all turned to watch the rain spirit, perfectly healed, fill the billabong with a steady stream of water from the blue Australian sky. Yippee for 
for the bunyip. Who shall we visit now? Oh, nice pickin'. Nice pickin' indeed. Mix and match is just coming up, champ. Hold tight. <laughs> Good eye, Koba. <laughs> That's one way to say hello, sport, in Australia. We're mixing and matching paintings like the Aborigines make. Aborigines were the first folk in Australia and have been here for 50,000 years. And if you hear a few funny-sounding words, well, that's strine. And it's how some of the local Aussies speak nowadays. Go! Good on ya! Here's the first animal for you in this box. You drag it to where its painting is. A crocodile. A kookaburra. Nicely done. A goanna. Only four left. A koala. A platypus. Two left, nearly there. A barracuda. A wombat. 100% correct! Well done, you. You got them all. Having a bonza time? Great. Let's play again. You're no drongo. You're ready for the hard round. Go! A snake. A goanna. A barracuda. A platypus. A kangaroo. A turtle. One left. A wombat. Way to go, pro. Wowzers, you did it. Staying down up. See ya, Chook. We'll come back soon. That's some collection of animals, Chester Ascarald. How about we look in on someone else now? Okay, let's go. Hey, uh, wait a sec. We'll be playing in no time. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> we are at a sheep station in the Australian outback. Woo! <laughs> the outback is the middle of this really, really big country. Yep, not many people live in the outback. Nope, but there are lots and lots of unusual animals. Yeah, honest. <laughs> Click on my belly and we'll meet some of them. Whoopee! Oh, that trough of water is for thirsty animals. Frill neck lizard! <laughs> Wanna see it run? <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> this is an echidna. <laughs> an egg-laying spiny anteater mammal. Whew, that's a mouthful. <laughs> I told you some of these animals were unusual. Frilly lizard! <laughs> That's to make him seem bigger than he is, yeah, <laughs> when he's scared. Termite mound! Ooh, <laughs> That's creepy. <laughs> Termites live there. But who else? Hmm? Oh, a wombat. <laughs> Kinda cute, huh? <laughs> he likes to bury himself. Ooh, strange. Boomerang. <laughs> Kinda curvy stick for rounding up animals. <laughs> and guess what? It comes back when you throw it. Yep. Hey, a bouncy kangaroo. Haha, <laughs> cool. Hey, he likes to box. Kookaburra. <laughs> Funny name. <laughs> Wanna sit in the tree? <laughs> Yeehaw! <laughs> Mr. Cowboy. <laughs> he likes to shear sheep.
Oh, a scorpion. <laughs> Watch out. Ah, get away with you. Bandicoot. <laughs> That's a funny word. <laughs> it's kind of like a rat. Ah, get away with you. Oh, a water holding frog. <laughs> she comes out of the ground to look for water. <laughs> She's kind of cute, huh? Wanna herd something with the sheepdog? Whoa! <laughs> that frog is storing water for when it doesn't rain. <laughs> yep, she can live off that water underground for a few years. <laughs> I'd like to be her friend in a drought. Oh, yeah. Dingo! <laughs> a wild dog. <laughs> and uh, sometimes a sheep stealer. Ooh, look out. <laughs> A sheep dog. <laughs> He's a good sheep herder. Yeah, nice doggy. <laughs> a horse. <laughs> The cowboy's horse, I bet. Come on, girl, giddy up. <laughs> Nate, a straight boomerang. <laughs> I can't play on an empty stomach! Oh, please! Hmm. Hey, you wanna leave the Outback? Okay, let's find the others. Come on. Just looking at the Outback makes me thirsty. Maybe we could find somewhere cooler, eh? Oh, bless you, darling. You chose me. Oh, I'm very touched. <coughs> darling, you just sit tight while I get my things together for this. Australia's Great Barrier Reef is just bursting with some of the world's wildest creatures. So grab your snorkel gear, darling, and let's all play. Velma's Fact or Fib. Go on and pick a fact, and we'll take a look at what's down under. But I gotta warn you, one or two of these aren't facts at all, just big old Velma-style fibs. Now you decide which is which. You ready? Ew! Don't he look tasty? Now that there is a crown of thorn starfish, and he's poisonous as all get out. You know what he loves to eat more than anything in the world? The reef itself. Just gobbles that coral right up. Now you tell me, is that a fact, or is that a big old fib? Oh, oh dear, I wasn't fooling this time, darling. These starfish actually suck out all the tiny living things inside the reef's coral skeleton, destroying them and the reef as it goes along. See that beautiful Australian beach? Why, the parrotfish actually helps make that sand. Yeah! It uses its beak-like mouth to nibble on coral, and after all the rock passes through its system, it, uh, well, it comes out the other end as bits of white sand. Now, does that sound like fact or a fib? You are absolutely right, yeah! There really are parrotfish, and they really do eat coral. Fact, they eat so much coral that one little parrotfish can poop out one ton of limestone a year. <laughs> now that's a whole lot of sand. My goodness! Here we have your green sea turtle. These gals spend their lives at sea and only come ashore to lay eggs. 
Now, they're so persnickety about where to lay those eggs, they'll sometimes swim up to 1,200 miles just to find the perfect beach. Now, what's your verdict, honey? Am I factin' or fibbin'? <laughs> Correct mundo, lamb chop. And when those mama turtles do find just the right beach, they go ashore and lay up to 200 eggs in one sitting. Pick a fact. This here is what you call your Portuguese man of war. You see, that big thing sticking out of the water is filled with air to help him float. And he drags along those huge poisonous tentacles to catch fish and other sea animals. Now what do you say? Is that a fact? Or is that a fib? Oh. Whoops, oh dear. You may not believe this, but it's true. And not only that, these man o' wars shoot out teeny tiny barbs from their tentacles that are so poisonous they could kill a person. Or a pig, for that matter. Go on and pick a fact. These fellas are called sponges. They swim around in big schools, and they act like a natural car wash for fish who happen to swim through them. Wiping them down, cleaning their scales. Oh, most fish come out of a school of sponges squeaky clean. Now give me your opinion. Is that a fact, or is that a fib? Oh, oh honey, I got you this time. Sponges are animals, but they don't swim in schools, and they don't clean other fish. No, no, they live attached to rocks on coral reefs and feed themselves by filtering tiny bits of food from all the water that passes through them. Pick this good looker's called a sea cucumber. And if I were a fish, I'd think twice about going after him. Cause you know how a sea cucumber protects itself? By spitting out its guts at an attacker. Now what do you think, pumpkin? Am I serving you up a fact or a fib? Oh. oh, it does sound like a fib, don't it? But it's not. Why, the sea cucumber's guts even look like spaghetti and are covered with poison to confuse and entangle its attacker. Stranger still, it actually grows a whole new stomach once it gets away. Click on any picture and off we go. Oh, glory, oh my, oh my. A reef full of facts and I'm all washed up. So what do you say let's head for the beach and dry off and join the others? Velma, your knowledge knows no boundaries. Okay, my friend, please choose another activity, eh? All right, let's check them out. Hang on, please. We're just getting ready. Hmm? Some days I like to imagine I'm a different animal, and there's plenty to choose from in Australia. Would you rather be a cockatoo or an emu? Or maybe you would like to be a kangaroo? There's lots of funny animals out in the bush Who live in the land down under Would you rather be a wallaby or a wombat? Or maybe a koala? What do you think of that? Perhaps the crocodile is the one that makes you smile He lives in the land down under On the land or up a tree We're living in the land down under Where did the others go? Monkey Let's go Sue. see! That was a visual treat beyond compare Now, maybe you can choose another Oz adventure for us Let's consult the map That's the clever way to travel if we went everywhere at once, we'd be in Mex Giptralia, or Perosh China Way, or Gapan. <laughs> but for now, let's choose one. This grid shows all of our world tour activities. A star indicates where we've been already today. You can choose any one of the activities here. Click on it to go straight there. <laughs>
That was mind boggling. And now, select somewhere to take us, huh? Are you all finished? If you are, choose the red quit button once again, just so we can be sure. Or, uh, hey, click anywhere else for, uh, more fun and games with us. Yeah, come on. Goodbye, my friend. <laughs>